There it is. So, welcome to the Wikipedia uh, session of this Wing Satellite. We are super excited to have you all here. Um, and the two organizers of this part, at least, uh, we are uh, Francisco Ortiz and Ana Jaramillo, who is also in the video. So, <laughs> thanks for saying hi. In that way, everybody can recognize you. <laughs> So I'm doing my PhD actually in the University of Manchester and Anna is doing her PhD in the University of Exeter. Not so close as you might think, <laughs> but at least the same country. So the timetable for today, how is everything going to work? Because any Wikipedia session is different, okay? <laughs> so this one is going to have uh, their own kind of procedures. Um, so the this is going to be the timetable. We are now in the first part. Uh, the first session is going to be that that is in purple, the first two lines. Uh, and we are going to talk a little bit about the impact of making visible women on Wikipedia. And that way we are going to understand a little bit why we are doing this actually and why it's relevant. And then a second part, I'm going to be talking about how to write bios all the practicalities, uh, like tips, that, that kind of stuff is super like practical. <laughs> uh, and then we're going to have a break. And as Anna and I, we are in UK, we are not from here, but <laughs> as we are in here, we are going to do like a pop quiz in that moment. So we are going to have a 20 minute break, but we are going to have like 10 minutes of a quiz because also Wings is not only about learning stuff and knowledge, it's also about socializing. So it's going to be a great moment to just having fun and trying to answer uh, questions that actually I didn't know the answers before I saw them. So <laughs> feel comfortable with that. And the second session is going to be working in the biographies. And in that session, Anna is going to be moderating everything. She's going to be in charge and we are going to make groups and in those groups, we are going to be working on biographies. So then uh, she's going to explain more how to do that. But let's start with the first part. Oh, and something really important is that we are all learning together. So please feel free to ask questions at any point. You can just unmute yourself. I don't feel uncomfortable with that at all. I can see the chat uh, and I can see the videos. So if you do this, I can see you. But to be um, just to be more practical, you can just unmute yourself and interrupt me. <laughs> I don't care. So the first part, okay, let's see what is uh, the impact of making visible women on Wikipedia. So this is Wikipedia. You all know this web page probably. Uh, actually, remember it from when it started. Uh, and you have this part in the below. Uh, the whole of the whole window. And that's really important because actually Wikipedia, today we're going to be only working in Wikipedia in English and you have different Wikipedias. You have one per language. And that's relevant because actually each language has an amount of article that has been written on them. So if you by any chance are have the privilege of knowing more than one language, please give it a chance maybe to add articles that are already in the English Wikipedia. And actually you can work translating them to another languages because there are languages that actually have only 10,000 articles and actually they uh, continue all the languages but I don't have a space <laughs> to put them all. And there are other languages that really have like 100 articles or something like that. So they really need <laughs> articles uh, to being translated from English to those languages. So Wikipedia is a foundation, okay? It's not profit organization. And the thing with Wikipedia is that actually so huge that has all those different organizations in it. It's not only Wikipedia. <laughs> and the other thing that's relevant is that it's actually super, um, current in the service. So you can download in your cell phone and actually works pretty well. Um, so they're really good in those stuff, but we are going to have a look in others that they have some problems. So I was thinking how is the best way to present you what is Wikipedia? And maybe the best way is looking into the Wikipedia article 
about Wikipedia. So they, exactly as they say, is a free multilingual online encyclopedia, but something that is relevant in this definition is actually there is, is a community of volunteers contributors. So you don't have any, you don't win any money for doing this. <laughs> it's just voluntary, volunteering. It's just because you are interested in getting spread the whole knowledge. Um, it's just that. So actually, to be honest, the whole idea behind it is really like a novel, maybe in some sense. Uh, and it's an open collaboration. So it's, it's supposed to be in the whole world uh, and actually has more than 300 languages editions. So that's a lot. And what I would like to uh, add in it is that the Wikipedia is very conscious about their systematic bias about gender. Uh, they have a lot of projects currently that we are going to see some of them. Um, but this is not something that it was always in there. So the first 10 years probably was something that they didn't talk so much. But then after that, it was like, okay, this is a problem. We need to do something for it. Uh, and actually that's when they start creating these kind of editathons. So um, these kind of events are actually produced because a lot of women start saying, okay, this, there is a problem in here. We don't have so many women in here. Uh, maybe you need to work on that. Wikipedia was created in 2001, so a long time ago, but actually it was in the school, so I remember it. <laughs> and uh, it was created for these two, by these two guys. Um, in general, we don't see the people who create this stuff, and it's always useful to know who are they, actually. So uh, about the impact of Wikipedia is very constant in the whole story. Uh, actually, I cannot even say that number of people who are looking the page every day, like that's the month, the total amount in the last month who, who people was looking into one page. So it's amazingly high. And it's relevant that they are also they also say that a high proportion of that is the, by children. We are actually not so sure because they don't have the, the disaggregate data <laughs> and I would like to have it and also by gender, but this is what we have, okay? So, uh, the amount of editors. We have uh, a huge peak of editors. That's the people who edit something in Wikipedia in 2007. But then actually it started declining and it has been a little bit not so constant the amount. And now it's start going up a little bit <laughs> again, just because of the pandemic. So actually something that uh, it was good for Wikipedia, actually it was the pandemic because a lot of people was going to Wikipedia to inform themselves and using it again. So it has started to be a trending right now again. Uh, about this is interesting just to say that actually a lot of people in around the world is looking into Wikipedia and is editing in, in the Wikipedia. So you can see each language is one charge and uh, the country or well, the continent where those edits uh, came from. So for example, in English, uh, half of them came from North America and a huge proportion from Australia and Far East. So let's see some controversies because until now everything is beautiful, right? <laughs> so uh, this thing with openness is actually very tricky. It's not so uh, open and everything. So we need to be more careful with that. Um, because actually being so open tends to make this problem that they didn't realize at the first, but they are realizing right now that they have a lot of theology ideological biases because anyone in any part of the world can submit an article of any topics and they can say this is true or whatever. So even though there is some measures to take that out, they still can make that pages and maybe they can be there for a week and a week, as you saw, a lot of people is going to see those pages. Uh, and that's specifically in the English version is 
a huge problem. So actually the English version of Wikipedia has more restrictions because of that, which is the one that we are going to be using today. But also it has the problem with, for example, pornographic. There are some articles about those topics. And if you understand that this is an open platform for uh, that actually a lot of children are looking at, you are definitely uh, having like uh, a huge problem, right? <laughs> because you cannot filter those information. <laughs> I definitely agree with Alice. <laughs> So um, another problem is sexism, right? The same bias happened with gender. And uh, since 2008, this has been something that Wikipedia is worried about it. Um, so they start to make some things, but actually, to be honest, all the initiatives have started from women. So I have to recognize that <laughs> that's a huge thing. So let's see what about women. This is the amount of editors, uh, well, edit, no. Uh, they call BLP to the biographies of living persons. So this is the graph that shows that actually, definitely male biographies are the majority. And if we only look into the females, we are going to see a difference in between the females, like the new uh, articles created about females and the new art uh, and the already existing ones. So since 2017, actually, you can see a, a little bit a high, uh, a higher level in there. Actually, there is when the data zones started to get more spread around the world. So actually it's getting an impact, but again, it's going down. Um, and what happened at the first, the first case actually, the first controversy about this stuff in gender and Wikipedia, it was this one about Marie Curie. Actually, Marie Curie, even though she's an amazing scientist, uh, she was sharing uh, an article with her husband. So actually the whole, the main character of her article, it was uh, the husband. So that is when I start all this stuff, like saying, hey, maybe she already deserves her own biography, right? So in Wikipedia in general, the editors are more males, 84 to 91% in 2018. This is that year. And from all the biographies, 70% of Wikipedia biographies were about women in that year. So today that doesn't change too much. Uh, this is the last number that actually I found uh, available and it's only a 20% of the biographies are about women. Uh, so we still have this gap and we need to do something about it. <laughs> so uh, it has been a lot of, uh, in social media, a lot of people talking about this, especially in March, because in March we have the women's, uh, the International Women's Day. So a lot of people start talking about this stuff. And another case, for example, another controversy was the case of Kathy Bowman. I don't know if you know her, but that's a computer scientist that in 2019, uh, she was in the team who actually get captured the first image of a, of a black, black hole. So definitely you can say she deserves having her own article, but actually the article was pulled out the same day that it was submitted. So we are having a problem because it's not that we have less biographies, but actually we are having the problem that they are being deleted after they are submitted. So we are going to have a look into that. Um, one explanation that actually Wikipedia says a lot because maybe allows them so, uh, defends themselves better <laughs> is that 90% of the editors are male and this idea that actually editors can uh, create a, like a pool and they can decide which uh, biographies are really novel, they say, like notability, they have a criteria. And they say, okay, this one is not so good, maybe we need to delete it. And a huge problem with that is because we have the test of notability. And the whole point is that is there significant coverage of the topic in secondary sources? And if those sources are reliable, reliable, but that's a huge problem for women because we have 
not so many sources about women. So it's like a whole loop situation uh, because you cannot make good references if you don't already don't have good sources. So yeah, so I did an experiment. I went to Wikipedia. I put a random word like woman in network science. <laughs> and the first page that it came out is women in science. I, if you look at it, it's super interesting web page. You have a lot of information. I actually learned a lot with it. But then I start looking at it and you have this kind of signs. And you have a lot of disputes in it. Like you have a lot of problems in the whole article and those in general, apparently at least in the uh, columns that I read, <laughs> there is a lot of them in, especially in uh, articles about women, not so many in articles about men. So that's a problem. Um, so, uh, it's like men who are rejecting women are the huge problem, right? Uh, but also female Wikipedia editors are only between nine and 16%. Uh, I only added this because actually that <laughs> is an article of using mixed method that actually came out this Monday and I was fascinated reading it. And it's really good, I recommend it. And she was actually talking that actually this is a gender inequality thing that we need to be worried about. Um, and that actually is affecting all the AA uh, systems right now. So in the future, it's going to have a huge impact because all those systems are using this information from Wikipedia. And she actually make this point that uh, you can see the darker uh, line is the woman biographies. And all of them are the most like the leader or because when you have an article, they can discuss, uh, they have a discussion about is if worth it or not to be in Wikipedia. And that discussion is more common to have it in women biographies. And that's the whole thing with this uh, graph. So, however, there is still hope, okay? We can do something to change this stuff. And that's actually why we are all here. So I don't know if you know her, uh, she's Dr. Jess Wade, and she's uh, an amazing person actually, who actually make 1000 Wikipedia's biography of women, people of color and LGBTQ plus scientists in, I think in a couple of years or actually less. Um, and actually you can still have hope because today if you go to Wikipedia, she actually has her own Wikipedia page now. So you can say, okay, this is worth it. Uh, you can still do this stuff. And there is a lot of people working. Uh, so I also found the story of these four amazing women uh, who are actually uh, making a lot of views about this stuff and they are spreading the word about being editors on Wikipedia and how you can make actually a lot of changes in Wikipedia and not only adding biographies, but you can actually do a lot of stuff. So if you have, if you don't have so much time to do a whole biography because it's a lot of time, um, you can still do another stuff. You can go to the discussions panels, you can defend one woman's article, you can, uh, actually you can add uh, one paragraph of a book of a specific scientist. You can do those stuff in a free time and it's not so much time to be honest. Another project that I would like to highlight is Week Project Woman in Red. They have a lot of information. They are amazing again. <laughs> Another amazing group of women. And they are working for uh, their purpose is that not so many women articles get deleted. So actually you can see that in their webpage, they have this list of articles for deletion, which are the discussion panels who are discussing about if that person is worth it or not. So actually you can go ahead and click on them. And maybe if you know something about that scientist or that person in general, you can maybe add something in the discussion. So they reunite um, all this information in just one site, which is super useful. Then you have the Wiki Project Women Scientists. That's another useful thing that they have because you can see a lot of good articles and they categorize all the articles because of the quality and importance of them. So it's super useful if you want to know 
how many women uh, have biographies, which are good, which are not so good, which maybe needs some completion. So it has a lot of information. So actually we can, uh, when we go ahead and check Wikipedia first, we say maybe we don't have so much to do, but actually there is a lot to do. So check those web page. Um, yeah, that was the same that I was saying. <laughs> so the second part, how to write these bios. Until now, everything all right? <laughs> Thank you, Anna, for sharing that uh, article and also uh, Carolina for sharing that, that one. Yeah, it's really good and actually it's mixed method. So I love that kind of methodology. <laughs> so thanks both. So how to write a bi biography? This is going to be in general first. Actually, Wikipedia is really good educating people to write biographies. So they have an introduction web page in which you can have all the information about it. And then you have a manual of styles, which is actually how you, the whole formatting of the biography. That's it's just us, it's just the format. But we are going to see a little bit about the basic content in a biography. So first you have the first paragraph, which is actually probably the most important part in the whole biography, because a lot of people actually who are saying, this is really a notably, notably person, uh, they are saying that based on the first paragraph sometimes. So we need to pay attention to that one. And I'm going to use an example of Simone de She's a French writer, a feminist, uh, an amazing writer, actually. And in the first paragraph, you can see that kind of format is something that everyone does in every biography. And that's really good. It's like the nationality, the years, the what is uh, her role, like her, her impact. She was a French writer, intellectual. So you can actually do exactly almost the same paragraph in any movement. Uh, and that's really good. So follow that kind of format. Then the second thing is the info box, which is this box that we all recognize immediately. It's always in the right side of the article and you can see this information. And what is important of this info box is actually that is linked to Wikidata which is actually a web page that um, is also using, well, Google is also using Wikidata for those learning processes and machine learning. So we need that this information is super clear, but this is generated automatically. So you don't need to work so much in this, you need to work in the biography and the biography needs to be super clear because in that way, uh, this information is going to be clear. Three, so the biography, okay? So the biography is, the most important thing in the biography is that everything that you say has to have a reference. Um, obviously not everything is going to have a reference, but uh, try that the majority or the big statements have one. So let's see the example of uh, Simone de Beauvoir. You can see the whole content. That's the whole biography actually content. And in one part, it has the personal life. So everything related not with her job and her work, her like a scientist is in the personal life description. So that's really good because you also separate those stuff because we want to encourage that women are recognized by her uh, knowledge and by, by her achievements rather than just uh, her personal life. Four, we have scientific works because we are thinking in scientific biographies, okay? So that's why this is uh, the four. So we have scientific works, career and some publication. And it's a little bit like the story about scientific trajectory and it's not a list of achievements, okay? It's not a CV. Uh, and it only as a general advice, only tell the most relevant publications because Definitely today we have a lot of people who have an amazing amount of articles in their lives and we cannot publish all of them because it's too much. Uh, so just pointed out the most relevant ones. 
So as an example, Simone de Beauvoir is still working. <laughs> she has amazing books and novels. And something that I really like of this biography is that uh, they add a notable works section, which actually have two paragraphs per uh, book that she published. So they resume what is the work that she did in that book, which is super useful because again, we are uh, encouraging that people uh, get to know about her work rather than her personal life. But another way to do it is adding a section about impact. Uh, <laughs> Hi Maria, yeah, <laughs> that's amazing that you are excited to me. You're like, this is the kind of passion that we need. <laughs> so the other section is impact. Uh, so in impact, they have this highlighting the most important uh, book, and actually her mo most important book is the concept, uh, which is an amazing book if you didn't read it <laughs> yet. And uh, they have other feminists who already talk about her and about that book. And they they help to us say, like, they, this is an amazing book, she's an amazing intellectual. So we can use that information to show the level of impact of this woman. And also at the last, uh, we have the awards of recogni and recognitions. You can add prizes and that's super useful again because we are saying this is a person who actually needs to have an article. Uh, in her case, she was only highlighted with three parishes, but actually, you know, she has more. So probably that's something that it needs completion. Uh, and also you need to add an hyperlink to that prize because in that way you can say, yes, it's relevant, this prize. The last thing, the photograph, that's a tricky one. <laughs> so if you're going to do your biographies, what I will recommend as is something that actually Wikipedia recommends for people who are, uh, well, Simone de Beauvoir is dead right now, so definitely that's a different story. And, um, but because you are going to do biographies of people alive, please tell them that you are going to do that, that biography, they are going to be feeling wonderful. <laughs> they are going to be super flattered and it's going to be amazing. And you are going to be contacting them. So that's amazing for you too. Um, and the whole reason is saying to them, we have some problems with copyright. So probably uh, maybe can you send me a picture of you, like a professional picture and I could add it. And Take care that it's not a picture from the university because that means that the copyrights are from the university. So it needs to be a picture from them. Uh, yeah, if you don't have a picture, it's fine. That doesn't care, but just be careful with it. And it's also a nice opportunity. I have done that of sending an email to a senior person asking the photograph and they actually feel very wonderful. So you are going to make their day actually. So some of the tips, uh, each article has a discussion and view history tab, which are super useful because you can see the whole history of change. If you want, if you have a doubt about one article or something, you're going to see it in there. Uh, the whole biography needs to be understandable to non-scientific readers. Okay, so it's a general public, it's not experts in the specific field or that person. And trying to incorporate links to other concepts. Uh, that's really good. I'm going to show you like this. All the concepts and the words that are in blue, they are already linked to another articles. That means that the whole machine of media, at least how it's working right now, is, going, is more likely to show your biography to others if you have those links. So try to do that, okay? Any concept that you find, <laughs> trying to link it. Uh, well, not any, you are not going to link all the words in the biography, but I think I explain myself. <laughs> so the biography is also a story, okay? It's not a list of achievements, so be careful with that. You are t telling a story and do not demean people in it in the same sense. So that's important. About the privacy, we are talking about people who are right now <laughs> living their lives. Uh, we don't want to be uh, annoying with them. <laughs> so we want to respect the privacy. So be careful with the dates of birthday. Do not add that and do not add the content, the contact 
or neither the address of where they live, even though if this is the address of the university, don't do that. And also the email, do not add that information because we are not doing a LinkedIn webpage. We actually are doing a story of their achievements. So maybe take that out. Uh, I have that mistake in my first biography. And <laughs> maybe it's, it's not a good idea. <laughs> So then, uh, in general, Wikipedia uh, recommends a minimum of five references. I don't know, that depends entirely of you. Uh, if you have five references, it's fine for the first biography. Uh, it's perfectly fine, but maybe it's going to be better if you have more, because if you have a lot of information in the biography, you need to back up all that information. So it definitely depends on the amount of words of your page. Uh, and don't use social media as a reference, okay, <laughs> because that's something that a lot of editors tend to say, tend to argue that that's not a good reference and that's some of the reasons that they use to put out those biographies, so don't give them an argument for doing that. So how to write women's biographies. Uh, this is like a whole statement that Wikipedia add in their webpage, so you can find this later. Uh, you, if you Google like women's biography, I think, yeah, women's biography, you are going to find Wikipedia this the same information. So what they recommend uh, is don't use surnames, so don't use only one name or use the complete name because you are in that way you are not going to infantilize her. Uh, mail is not default, as any of you know. <laughs> so uh, don't use words like woman, female, or lady in the meantime, because it has been found that the biographies in in the women biographies in general have the, those words uh, a lot, but the male biographies doesn't have those words. So we are trying to be really gender neutral in here. Uh, first woman. Yeah, the idea of adding someone for being the first woman who leads something is need to be carefully written down because when you say the first woman of uh, to do X project, <laughs> uh, it's actually making the point that you don't have any other women doing the same or maybe in the same period or is making a, a statement and making a line that we don't want. So maybe trying to avoid that. It's not so bad actually, because some women actually were the first, for example, the first woman in the moon. So definitely nobody else did that before. <laughs> but uh, try to be careful. How do you phrase that? Info boxes, they are really important. Uh, but as, as I said, if you are super clear in everything, uh, you are going to be fine. Uh, and defining women by relationship. This is something that happened a lot. And as we saw, Marie Curie was the first example because she was defined as the, uh, the wife of his husband, who actually I have no idea the name, but <laughs> that kind of phrases, try to avoid it. Uh, we are not defining them by their relationship because they are the daughter of some historian or the wife of an actor. We don't care that um, you can add that information in the personal life, definitely, because it's something important for them. But it's not something that is going to be in the first paragraph or it's not something that is going to be in their list of works. And the same goes for marriage. OK, so if you are talking about the person, uh, try to highlight their, for example, degree rather than uh, Mrs. or Mr.s or those kind of definitions. Is we are trying to highlight the achievements, right? And the internal links is also the other thing that I already said to you about the concepts, links to other concepts. Sources, try to use sources of women. So if you know that uh, a lot of women use a web page specifically for some information, try to use them. Um, images, try not to use images that actually show women as an object. So that's terrible to say, but actually it has happened. Uh, or like the secondary character, so be careful with that. 
and gender neutral language. If you go to the web page that I'm saying to you already, maybe later I can leave the link in there. Uh, you're going to find how to do that because it's super tricky and it's, it's wonderful when you learn how to do it. World order, we in general said husband and wife, uh, that's a huge tendency in the whole world. So maybe we can play with that. We can start saying wife and husband if you need to write something like that. Be careful with that and don't use girls or ladies. Don't use those words at all. At least, well, if you're talking about someone who is the first lady, of course, you're, you can use it. But if not, maybe try to avoid those ones. So notability guidelines. Um, this is a tricky part because it's about, this is the whole argument about when a biography is relevant to be in Wikipedia or not. So you can go to this web page and then you're going to have a list of the criteria that they use. And one of them is the academics, which is the one that obviously we are using today. I'm going to pass that. And the criteria is here. So when you say some of the phrases, it's perfectly fine, but you need to back up. And they give you some uh, ideas of how to back up that information. So for example, this one, the person has received a highly prestigious academic award or an honor at a national or international level. If you say something like that, it's perfectly fine, but you need to back up in a way that uh, people are not going to make delete them. <laughs> so they give you tools, they give you uh, advice of how to do that. And they have that for any part. For example, this one, I found it super difficult. The person academic work has made a significant impact in the area of higher education. It's like, you can say that of maybe all <laughs> women in the universities in the, around the world, but maybe that's a difficult phrase to back up uh, and I'm trying not to add it at all now <laughs> because you need to back up with several books authored for that person with a widely used as a textbook. So publishing one book is terrible hard <laughs> and they are asking that the person has many books and actually textbooks. So it's not any kind of books. So maybe if you can avoid that kind of sentence, okay, yeah, whatever, we are avoided. Uh, but if you can back up that, incredible. Um, And citation metrics, sometimes we use to this citation metrics to say that this person has a huge impact, but actually they are a little bit tricky. So they use a lot of web of science and Scopus and that's perfectly fine. But some people when you use Google Scholar and PubMed, uh, they are not so good in terms that the editors tend to say they are not so reliable. So maybe be careful using which kind of citation metrics you use. Uh, Wikipedia at least recommend Web of Science and Scopus. So let's see a good example. Marie Curie. This is one of the examples that uh, Wiki projects recommend. Um, and Marie Curie is an amazing scientist. We all know that. He, she has a lot of awards, a lot of doctoral students. Uh, we can see that she has a uh, this amazing picture in which she's in the below part with surrounding by men, which I found super impressive kind of picture. Um, but she also has a lot of information. She has the perfect first paragraph uh, as the first of the Curie family legacy of five Nobel Prize. They're talking already about the Nobel Prize. So you already know, okay, this person needs a biography. Uh, you have information about the early years, about how was her life in Paris. You have a lot of pictures. <laughs> you have information about the new elements that she discovered. You have information about her legacy, her honors and attributes. Uh, and also actually you have information in popular culture because you, we already know that there have been a lot of movies and books about her. So you can add that kind of information if you have it. And she also have a lot of references. Uh, she has actually 123 references and they are all amazing articles. Uh, I was checking some of them and they are all very reliant. And so they, this is a perfect biography. If you don't know how to do this, go ahead and check this biography. 
uh, don't be too scared about the amount <laughs> of words that this biography have, because obviously Marie Curie has already a lot of books only about her. So it's pretty easy to find uh, good references for all this stuff. So don't be intimidated by that at all. Okay, let's see some examples of women in network science because we are in women in network science. Pip Pattison. Uh, I know probably a lot of you know her and she has a biography. Uh, this is a really good one because actually it's longer than the other ones. <laughs> um, but the first paragraph is super short. Uh, maybe we can complete something in there. Uh, and in the career, because it's only two pages actually. So it's not, she's an amazing person who has done a lot. And actually you can say a lot about her work in social networks, but in here it's not so full of details. So definitely this is a perfect first biography, uh, but maybe now is the moment that someone else take it uh, again and say, okay, maybe I can add one paragraph of one book. Excellent, you can add it in there. Bernice Pecosolido, I don't know if you know her, but she's another amazing <laughs> academic. And she only has one paragraph, actually, the first paragraph only. Uh, so definitely needs work in it. So if you are interested, go ahead, add information in it. Uh, Elizabeth Bott, this is an amazing sociologist uh, in social networks, one of the first one. Um, and she has an amazing biography first in the life but then in work we only see the references like <laughs> only that and definitely family and social network is a huge book it's an amazing book with a huge impact so definitely that deserves some writing uh, she deserves maybe at least five paragraphs only describing that book so we have to work <laughs> on it uh, Anochka Ferligov, I know some of the, someone is already in charge of this one because as that person actually was saying, I definitely agree, she has some information, but actually even Wikipedia is saying with that uh, sign, is saying this article needs additional citation for verification. So probably it's already had been some discussion. Thanks, Daria, yeah. <laughs> so Daria is the person who is going to be working in this one and she's going to be completing this one because probably it's in a discussion panel right now and we don't want to lose this biography. We want that uh, this still be there. Helen Jennings, we all probably know Jennings, the surname because her work with Moreno, but actually she made an amazing work in sociometrics. Uh, and we don't know so much about her. And the whole biography is, is really good, actually. But you have a lot of men talking about her. And in the first part, you have a lot of the work done by Moreno. So maybe we could add more about her work, <laughs> like individually. Another example, Larissa Lonitz, she's another well, I'm super fan of these people, <laughs> so it's a very subjective kind of presentation, but I uh, love her work. Uh, she's the first person so she, who actually brings networks to Chile, so it's a closer example. <laughs> uh, and she actually makes a lot of work. She has a, the whole description of career, awards and honors. But when we go again to the selected work, we only have a list of works. So we don't have a description of what she has done in each of them. Um, and some of her work in the 70s is really difficult to get uh, access. So if any of you know about her, uh, maybe you can add one paragraph about a couple of them. And that's definitely something amazing to add. Uh, because you can tell a lot about, for example, her definition of reciprocity, and you can only add that definition in there. And that's has a huge impact because you are already talking about her work rather than only the list of achievements. References and that's it. So we have biographies about creative women network science, but we lack of a lot of them. Uh, and we have a lot of them that they need competitions. 
so we already have some people responsible for some of them biographies. Uh, if you didn't get any of them yet, you can still send the, me an email to me or to Anna or contact us by Twitter, whatever do you prefer. And you can uh, register yourself for one of these biographies. Um, so how we are going to work. So in the second session, we are going to have time to work together in the biographies. Uh, if you have some of those, that's amazing. If you don't have some of those, that's fine too. Uh, because definitely we are in July and June and this the end of the term. And it's a difficult moment for everybody. So what we're going to do is to upload the biographies is when we are going to give you two options. So the first one is you can finish it whenever you want in the time that you need in any moment. And actually if in three months you ended up completing it and if you want a second thought about it, you can still send that to us. and Maybe we can give you some advice or some feedback. Um, but the second option is that we are going to wait until the 31 of July for the biographies. So if you have a biography already complete, we are going to be working with Anna in August to submit them all together. Um, and hopefully by the name of Wings with an account from Wings. So in that way, it's going to appear like Wings doing this stuff and not us. Um, yeah. So that's the second option. You can send it by the 31 of July. If you cannot do it by that day, just send us an email with the understand those stuff. So you can send it maybe later, but just let us know. In that way, we are going to have your biography in mind. So let's have a little Q&A. If you have any questions, you can tell us. Um, I think I give you a lot of information, so maybe it was <laughs> a lot to process. So. I have a question. Can I maybe? Sorry. Um, I didn't sign up because I didn't have time at first, but now I could make some time. So I wanted to ask if I can pair up with somebody maybe because I might have to leave again. And like, I'm, I don't want to commit for a whole one because I don't know when I have to leave again, but I would love to support somebody. So if somebody needs support, I just wanted to say that. That's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so what we're going to do maybe is I can send you with copy uh, because we have an email uh, chain like we are, in which we are registering people who are responsible of each biography. So I'm going to add you in there. That's fine, Leonie? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Perfect, thanks. Any other questions? Well, still if I can- I have a question. Yeah. Hi, thanks a lot. It, it was very informative. Uh, maybe I missed this, but can you tell more about these Wikipedia editors and how you become or like, how does it work? Is it someone from Wikipedia can make you editor or you can editor yourself? So who are these people? Can you tell a bit more? Yeah, sure. So when you go to Wikipedia, you can create a user. Okay, so you become a user. And it's super easy. It's like opening a Gmail account. Actually, I think it's more easier. <laughs> um, and it's super straightforward. Guys. So you have your username, you can log in into Wikipedia and you can add or propose any bio after that. So as a user, you have the ability to add those stuff and propose these changes. Any change that you add is going to be, um, they have like a score system in which they score editors. So all the users in the whole system, they get scores. So you, actually you have people who are super active. Uh, for example, Dr. Jade Away, definitely she's had an amazing score, but the score is about the amount that of biographies that you submit each month. So it's constantly in time. So it's not, if you submit 15 <laughs> biographies in one month, doesn't care the next month probably. It's going to care, but not so much. <laughs> so these people is people around the world who are just working in this and it's almost like a hobby. Uh, so anyone could make that changes. For someone to delete some biographies in the specific, they, uh, 
they open a discussion panel. You can, for example, if you found something in Wikipedia that you say, okay, this is very biased, uh, maybe I would like to add a change, you can propose that change. And some of them depends of your score or depends of um, the article in itself. Some of them go to a panel of discussion, which is everything public. So you can see it if you have your user, your user there. Um, so you can see the discussions coming in and you can see all these people having some disagreements or not. And you can actually say something <laughs> in there. So that's the whole thing is depends on you. Actually, <laughs> a lot of them is depends of going ahead in the Wikipedia page and trying to propose some stuff. Um, yeah, that's the way in which it works. I don't know if I was clear enough. Thanks. Yeah, OK. Uh, and also, I would recommend if you are doing a username, sometimes people uh, tend to use their names for the username. So if you are new and you don't have a username yet, trying to create one with a surname or a nickname or something like that, that is not exactly your name because uh, that creates some confusion in the system. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so you can use the name of someone. Well, not, don't use the name of an academy neither, <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay, so Let's go to the to do the quiz and to take a break. Uh, so wherever you are, this is the time in EDT time. Uh, until 9, 10, we are going to have a break, but we are going to be doing a quiz right now. So if you want to take a break, it's your free decision, but we are also going to be here doing the quiz. So you can manage your own time right now. Um, so let's do this, okay? <laughs> we are going to do the, Anna, okay. you want to say something? So while you are in the quiz, I, uh, we prepared some uh, dry <laughs> files for you, uh, for the names that, um, that Francisca gave you. So while you are in the quiz, I want you to say uh, with whom do you want to ask? Like in which biography, like this is free. So you can select and the idea is that we all work like together. So I will share you this uh, drive document. Uh, and uh, if the names of the, um, each, bio, each file has the name of uh, one of the biographies that we thought you could work. If you have another one, you can uh, tell us also. But during the quiz, please let me know by the chat. Uh, which one do you want to work in? Uh, that's it. Yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> I totally forgot. That's my fault. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. So Anna is going to be arranging right now the groups in the meantime that I'm doing the quiz. Um, yes. So first question. I actually didn't know many of them before doing this, but that's the idea. We are going to be learning together. <laughs> so this one is, who said this phrase? Who said, do not undertake a scientific career for fame or money, undertake it only if nothing else will satisfy you, for nothing else is probably what you will receive. Your reward will be the widen of the horizon as you claim, and if you achieve that reward, you will ask for no other. That's a super deep kind of way of thinking. <laughs> okay, so anybody knows the answer? You can say in the chat. You can actually, maybe you can decide a random letter too, <laughs> if you don't have any idea. <laughs> Of literacy, good point. We B, C, B. Okay, I'm going to see who was this one. Oh, why is it not working now? There it is. Uh, yeah, maybe I did 
too difficult <laughs> the thing adding Simone de Beauvoir definitely that was a good point it sounds super literacy <laughs> but actually it was Cecilia Payne Gapo I don't know how to say her surname but Gapo Kim hopefully someone correct me <laughs> uh, and she was an amazing person who was working on stars and she was working in one of these astronomic observatories for a long time so yeah I was surprised with this quotation. I was like, wow, like, <laughs> that's profound. Okay, let's try this one. In the context of the World War II, Bladeship Park was the place where Alan Turing decoded the Enigma machine. I think you all know that story. <laughs> and if not, you can see the movie, which is super good one. Um, this requires actually a group of mathematicians. And we always see this group as a group of women who were there working. But actually, we have numbers of that group. So how many of them do you think there were, like in total? This is an approximation, OK? Okay, good. <laughs> we have some answers. B or C, which one would it be? B. <laughs> Don't worry, Alice. I should have known actually some of them which were more social scientists that I didn't know, so I feel terrible. <laughs> so, um, actually it was A. Uh, more than actually I think it was more than 7,000 uh, women working in a huge room of people in there so uh, really <laughs> that's amazing okay I need to talk about about it with you because I definitely want to go there <laughs> before I leave <laughs> UK <laughs> so six more than 7,000 women. And in general, we know the story about Alan Turing, which actually is an amazing person and I love his story. But sometimes if you get like, okay, there were a lot of women in there who, what was her, their story? Like, we don't know. So, okay, can you guess who wrote or, it, well, some people could say edit the next image? And I'm going to have the best quality that I get <laughs> in the whole. Google. I spent like two hours Googling only this image and this is the best quality. But you have some clues in, in it, like the first line of the title. Uh, <laughs> I just saw your comment, Leonie, like, honestly. <laughs> okay, this is a full agreement. <laughs> I like this one. <laughs> yeah, it was the first programmer at a loveless, uh, probably with love her, <laughs> or I'm talking by me. Uh, and the second option is uh, this uh, man who actually, she correct his notes. Um, yeah, so amazing, <laughs> we get that one. So we can say that we are all network scientists. Definitely, that you can say that because of that question. <laughs> I try to be the bears, right, in the whole questionnaire. Okay, so who said? Perhaps it is difficult to rouse women, to rouse women and they are long suffering and patient. Now that we are aroused, I don't know how to say that. <laughs> we will never be quiet again. And if you know a little bit the history of UK, you're going to find that all of there are part of the suffragist movement. So maybe I did that too tricky <laughs> because all the options are uh, suffragist and from the whole movement. Well, some of them are the first one and some others the second one. Yeah, that's true. I forgot the name of the, it was the suffragist, the name of the movie? Something like that, like probably. <laughs> yeah. 
well, they're not too creative with the name, <laughs> but <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah, I recommend that one too. So let's see, Emily Pankur. Uh, Emily Pankur actually born in Manchester, here where I am. <laughs> so I love her story and she was an amazing person. Let's see the next one. For the people who know most, uh, more about literature. So Mary Shelley, post, I don't know how to pronounce her name. I have to practice that. <laughs> wrote in 1818, then got the novel Frankenstein, which actually probably we all know. Uh, when she started this book, where was she? Anyone knows this? She was in one of these cities that actually have been say that uh, she was inspired by that city. Um, well, she was from the UK, but she was in another city. Okay, I'm going to give the answer. Oh, <laughs> I just received all your answers, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, uh, it was in Geneva, actually. I was super surprised about that because I expect because of the cold weather, the rainy, it wouldn't be in France, Scotland or UK or any part of UK. <laughs> but actually it was Switzerland <laughs> that she was inquiring about that and she was in some holidays. And if you have saw Doctor Who, there is a chapter about that, which is super fun. So who said, be less curious about people and more curious about ideas. This could be anyone. <laughs> Thank you for giving that information about the, the film. That's it. Thanks, Alice. Oh, we have all the alternatives. <laughs> okay, one of them has got to be. <laughs> okay, whatever. It was Marie Curie. Uh, and actually, if someday you have the opportunity to go to see them and you go to the Nobel Prize uh, Museum, which is amazing, <laughs> you can see a lot of different stuff that they sell about Marie Curie and they have printed out this phrase in many of them, which actually I have in my fridge right now. <laughs> Okay, so in Harvard, uh, yeah, <laughs> I can give you more tips about that trip <laughs> later. <laughs> so in Harvard, uh, there was a, an amazing group of women, the Harvard computers in some point, who actually calculate and categorize the position of the stars. But they were paying so much less than men in that moment because of the same work. So one hour for them. How much do you think it, were, it was that the amount that they were paid for that job. We are just talking about one hour and we are talking about 1881. Yeah, that's a good point. I think it, well, uh, I have to make the, it was $1 and 25, between $1 and $1 and 25. It was men. That was a good tip, Anissa. That was a tricky question. <laughs> okay, we have B, E, then I'm going to <laughs> see. Okay, I was super surprised about this, but it was actually less than one quarter of what men was winning in the same moment. And I was like, and actually they resolve how to categorize stars. So if we don't have her, then uh, well, actually today we don't know probably how to do that. Okay, so recently a computer scientist used a white mask for the facial detection program to reveal racial bias. Do you recognize the name of the person who did this research? And if you have seen the documentary code bias, if not, please see it, <laughs> it's really good. Uh, this is the start of the documentary. Um, and I think she appears in an, another part in 
it was a huge polemic in United States, uh, I think last year. And she was working with the person who actually wrote the, bu the book. Yeah, see, sí. Carolina <laughs> guess it <laughs> immediately. Perfect. Yes, so she's making a huge work right now. And if you Google her, uh, she's uh, an amazing person who is doing actually the, how is the name? The American League of Justice, which is actually trying to uh, decode this kind of racial bias in coding. Okay, so according with the United States, until 2020, what percentage of researchers worldwide are women? Accordingly with this institution, okay? So probably we have a lot of people who are not there. <laughs> be, be, be. Okay, general consensus, <laughs> great. But no, I, I thought it would be more close to 50%, but apparently, the numbers that they have, maybe it's because they are more institutional numbers or I don't have any idea how they get that final number, but it's less than 30% suddenly. So this person, who is her? She is a mathematician who calculated the trajectories of Apollo 11, the mission which enabled men to take the, his first steps on the moon. Who is she? <laughs> a lot of bees. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yeah, we can we can have a, a huge bias here. <laughs> we all as a group have. Um, so okay, this is about network scientists right now. So from this list of people, random people that probably you know all of them, <laughs> how many of these professors actually work in the USA? Four or five, so B or C. Okay. Yeah, high the figures. That's a really good movie. Okay. <laughs> we should do another uh, panel only about movies. <laughs> okay, let's see. Four. Perfect. Yeah, so we have Martha Gonzalez, Catherine Faust, Brooke, Foucault, Wells and Bradbury. So they are all working today in USA. Now, how many of these professors have bachelor in physics or mathematics? It's the same list of people. This is more difficult. <laughs> Okay, let's see, there were five. So Marta Gonzalez, Victoria Colisa, Roberta Sinatra, Claudio Wagner, and Anushka Felicot. So amazing, you did all the quiz. Uh, thank you for participating in this quiz uh, and learning together. This is a fun way to just learn together. And I don't know, it's good to learn this kind of stuff all together. Uh, Hope you have a coffee right now or a tea or something. <laughs> we are going to have now, uh, I'm going to hand out the leadership to Anna. I'm going to start sharing. And we are going to have the second part of our Wikipedia workshops. Okay. Thank you so much, Francisca. That was so nice. <laughs> Very interesting tips and information. <laughs> Actually, we can do like that they were saying as a book club, we can do a movie club. <laughs> How interesting. Um, movies about women. So uh, I sent you uh, a Google Drive file. So today, and the ones, um, the women researcher that we have uh, in the list for us, if you don't recognize the names completely, I am the kind of person that I'm more like visual than with the names. So just photos and the name uh, to make you relate who is who. Uh, and the idea is that uh, if we can uh, work in groups or we can work alone in the files that uh, we gave you. Um, 
uh, in the Google Drive. And uh, something important uh, is that each Google Drive uh, has like already the name of the person and it has the um, sections that Francisca mentioned it. So if you enter, you already have like the name and what yeah, you should put inside. So the idea is that today uh, in this hour, we can work uh, as much as we can in the, um, in the uh, Wikipedia pages. And uh, after the session, you can open your uh, Wikipedia user if you don't have one now. So I think it's easier like to use the 50 minutes that we have to work in the Google Drives. And I think all of you have access. Uh, I will put an example of uh, a network scientist also and that I like the Wikipedia page that is uh, Raisa de Sousa. And uh, she has like, a, I think she has a good <laughs> uh, Wikipedia page because she has a nice uh, first paragraph introduction and like information about her career. It's not very like about her personal life, which is very nice. <laughs> and it's more about the work that she have done. And she has 20 references, which is so good. And uh, it's approved. So I will paste you the link here. And uh, also uh, something that uh, we want uh, that you do, uh, as Francisca said, is uh, when, when you finish, uh, try to um, like try to reach the person that you want to work on and uh, like also for approval and that you are, because sometimes we misunderstand information that is in web pages because there is not a lot of information about some of them. So also like for approval and for the photo as um, Francisca was saying. Uh, I was planning to divide all of us in different rooms, but uh, the link is to the folder, I think. Is it just one file? Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I gave you the... Okay, this one is the one to the folder. So I was going to divide all of us uh, per rooms, but I think we don't want to be alone in just one room. <laughs> because uh, we cannot be two per room because we are just 12. So also, if you have another person that you would uh, like to work on, uh, you can add uh, the, um, well, if you want, if you feel okay with that, you can add the, uh, the drive file here. And if you want to copy the structure, uh, it will be amazing. Uh, I started one about uh, Marta Gonzalez. So uh, mainly, um, like super in the first part. So something nice that you could do today is work information about the person and like uh, try to have like a very short paragraph, the first intro, and maybe have um, like as far as we can go and um, like the references for the information that you are searching. So if it's a newspaper about an award that uh, they earned or if it's a scholarship or uh, also the publications, like not just the list, uh, if we can have the links of the publications would be uh, much, much uh, easier. Also something nice, and because we work in networks and uh, in collaboration networks. So also if you can uh, put information about how, uh, with whom the person is working with, uh, it's very interesting because they get connected. And also, uh, if we want to go deeper, so go to the web page of that person and also like create that. This person work with um, with this other one. So for example, I will give, I will give an example that I'm ashamed of <laughs> because today I discovered that Catherine Faust is a name because of Basserman and Faust. I always thought <laughs> it was a name because uh, just the, um, I just thought about the last name. So also like make the connection between both of them. I'm not sure if Basserman has a Wikipedia link, but we cr can create that link. 
Uh, and uh, okay, and we have 30 minutes. We can work uh, as like as far as uh, you want to. And also, if you have more questions, and um, most of the of them, that's something that is nice. Most of them have web pages, uh, like their own web pages, uh, or from the university. So we can also use information from there. And uh, yeah, if you have any question, the idea, um, uh, I think that we can help all, like if you don't want to be involved in the, um, like uh, opening the user in Wikipedia and you prefer like editing here, uh, as Francisca said, we can uh, put the information in Wikipedia when uh, once all of them are done. And uh, yeah, and we can put there. Something important that, and that we put these names of uh, a huge list that we had before is that uh, like we need them to have some awards or recognitions like uh, that we can have references to them because in that way Wikipedia won't uh, put them uh, down in the case. So if they have a fellowship, uh, an award of the I don't know, Complex System Society or a young uh, award that would help a lot. Um, okay, and Carolina says, I think I feel this woman has the foundation keeper as well. Okay, yes, also that's a possibility. Also, something interesting that I found, uh, for example, Victoria Colitza has a Wikipedia page, but it's in French, just so if you know French <laughs> and want to do that part uh, faster, would be also would be interesting uh, and helpful. Um, oh, okay. In those drafts. Okay, <laughs> that helps a lot <laughs> if the draft already exists. I will copy those, I will open those links just for having a record. Oh, okay. And they had a deadline that we missed, but it's okay. We can work in all of them together yeah, to finish them. So if you have a question or information that you would like to add, Also something that uh, I would uh, ask you would be like, uh, if you can put the hyperlinks of where are you taking from the information? And in that way it would be easier uh, for us in case, uh, like at the end of the deadline, like to try to complete them with those links, that will be very helpful too. Okay. I think my filter of Google is strangely biased because I'm here and it showed me just the one in French. <laughs> Thank you, Alice. Alice, in the meantime, can I ask you, using this opportunity, can I ask you about how was that experience or what happened? Because I was looking into the discussion uh, or what happened with the biography of Brooke. I think we started making it at uh, the Vastapai Net Science Workshop last year. And then, you know, it does take some time. You can't usually finish it in a few hours. Uh, and then after the, the workshop, it kind of fizzled out because other people had other stuff to do. Um, so it was more about the time. It was not a problem with the bio. No, we, I don't think we've ever submitted it, actually. Um, okay. Oh, I see that there, there actually somebody had submitted a, uh, um, a draft 
already. So, but that's not the draft that we did. That's somebody else did a draft. So that's kind of cool. Two people thought, three people thought it was it was a good idea to, to and so on. Okay, that's good to know. Yes, I just ask you because this sometimes this stuff is because they found I don't know a sentence that it has not a good reference for them. <laughs> it's a little bit subjective, but uh, mm -hmm. if this is not the one that actually you did, right? No, this is a different one. But maybe we can we can use some of the information in this one and kind of match them together. Yeah, that sounds perfect. So one thing that I see here, and I, I don't know what kind of the, 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 the default way to do this is. So um, uh, if somebody is, uh, I see that they they refer to, to Brooke as Dr. Foco Wells instead of just Foco Wells. Like, do you use the, the titles when you refer to people throughout the text or do you drop them? So in general, what I have seen at least is that they drop all the titles in general, at least in the first mm -hmm. part, in the title, in the biography. Uh, but when they want to highlight that they were doctors at that point, they add it. So they are trying to be very neutral in everything, like <laughs> the whole stuff. So in that way, they don't need to call someone Miss because they don't have uh, the title or something like that. So maybe I'm bullying the doctor. One that I that I had was um, uh, can we like how fix that way on the um, uh, kind of section order that the the template has. So the one that it was declining, that's the thing. So in the, the the Google Drive we have intro, early life and education, research and career with um, uh, three sub. Sections and and then that's it. <laughs> is that is that a good um... in the draft or in Wikipedia? Yes. Um, I'm looking at it now. Now in the draft. So I think it's amazing all the information that you have here. To be honest, that's the first. Thing. It's what? a lot. Which do you have a lot of information in here, which is really good. It's, it's a mm -hmm. very good first draft. Um, so you were thinking in what to add specifically? So so for example, um, with the um, so in the draft that we had earlier, where I'm kind of copy pasting stuff uh, in from um, as you see. For the, the research section, so we had a separate section on, or we wanted to make a separate section on book authorship, where we wanted to put some reviews of the, the book that she's um, written. And um, for the, the research, we didn't have a separate section for publications because we're, we're referencing some of her publications as we kind of say things. So. Um, uh, like, do you have an example of how the what, what goes into the publication sections for maybe some of the the yes. uh, articles that already exist? Yes, yes. I'm looking that one. Maybe you know I know. One? Yes. Sorry, I cannot move this. The one of Raisa. Yes. That one. Um. So in the part of uh, publication, oh, sorry, this is in Spanish. <laughs> um, so in the part of publications, uh, this one was the one that I found that is more like a like a mm -hmm. citation, uh, like for papers when we cite in the last part the reference list. So this one is more oriented into that. And I think this is nice because then it's just like click the name of the paper and you can go. Um, something also that I've seen, but in authors of not in academia, but also there are tables. So they separate like books and they put the list of books and then the papers and the list of papers. So 
yeah, this was, this is more academician, but in the way that you feel uh, mm -hmm. more comfortable. And the idea is to having hyperlinks to most of the things in that way. It's easier for people to read their information. Got it. Thank you. So with the with the article for Brooke, we had like um, because she's like published so many things that we kind of identified um, three key topics and then wanted to have like these as, as bullet points and then okay. link to, to some of our references there. Something also that yeah, like could I don't know if she already has in her web page, but um something that the others uh, have is like um, highlighted uh, work that they decided to put in their web page and it's a list like a smaller list mm -hmm. but uh, also something nice is that you can say like this person works in i don't know for example with victoria this person works in epidemics of humans and you put in the references uh, like all the references but you don't name all the papers in that part so that goes in the reference uh, list after. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And as much awards and honors you can find, better <laughs> for the for them <laughs> and for Wikipedia to accept us the biographies. Mm -hmm. uh, Echo you has a question about the Claudia Wagner uh, webpage. I think we can do the disclaim because I've seen that you, when you search the name, they have like, uh, this name refers to uh, blah, 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 the, I don't know, Claudia Wagner, the model. And we can do the disclaim of this webpage refers to Claudia Wagner, the professor. So uh, I'm not sure how is, that is done, but we can do it. Yep, sounds good, thanks. Thank you, Francisca. I will share to you. It was just up no, also ah, up. because they have the list of publications but also a more up in the same page, you have notable work or something like that is that they call it. And they sometimes highlight like a specific book of the person okay. uh, there. Just, no. just as their personal life. <laughs> uh, so sometimes yeah. people have one amazing book and they want to highlight only that book more than in the list of publications. So sometimes they give them like one or two paragraphs about that book. Uh, but that depends on the case because right now we are all women scientists and <laughs> in this case, we have a lot of articles. <laughs> we don't tend to have so many books, but if someone has a book, you can do something like that. If you also want to contact them in name of us, like as part of uh, this, um, like we can eat that one. Uh, we would like to ask you if this is okay. Like also, I think it's a good practice if you don't want to just <laughs> name okay. yourself and have um, us as like in the back, also you can. And something nice, <laughs> I continue with the RISA example because uh, there is like a, I don't know if you find that in like news, in the part of Google in news, like uh, when there are some interviews of the professors. So there was like a, I don't know, an icebreaker, like information that the, she wa she had to take the decision of being fashion designer or, but then she decided to go to anesthesia physics. So if there is something interesting that you would like to highlight about their early lives also. Um, and if you find would be, would be nice to. And you can have this 
like the we put them the sections but if you want to add more sections you can and uh, when we put in wikipedia the um, the list of contents like is mainly done so uh, feel free for that too And you don't have to finish today. So just uh, as much as we can in this time. And if you want to put there the important links that you found also uh, for someone else or for you then uh, yourselves, like continue reading after and completing. Also, as some ideas, most of them have, like, are the directors of labs. So also, and those labs have web pages. So also talk about those labs it would be nice too. I have a question. Yes, so me. I was, um, I'm doing Catherine Faust and um, I found different websites, right? Descriptions of, of the book and other things. And I was thinking, uh, so of course now I just like copy paste and put the reference, but uh, is it important for uh, Wikipedia to rewrite it in a way that it's different because otherwise it's kind of like plagiarism, but with reference. So what is, uh, what is uh, the, the best option here? So you understand what I mean? So for example, I copy her description from the website and put it in Wikipedia. And then I put a reference, but it's exact, exactly the same words. Would you recommend to rewrite it in, a, in different words? or just leave it as it's on the website, but with the reference? At least what I have found, I don't know, Anna, if you have a different experience, but at least what I have seen is that they rewrite some stuff. Because if you are copying paste, uh, like a paragraph, like the whole paragraph, yeah, definitely it's going to be like a problem. <laughs> uh, because as you were saying, uh, maybe the best idea is to rewrite just because we don't want to give an argument or a reason to these editors to download this uh, biography. So if we can rewrite some stuff, well, sometimes you cannot rewrite the title or the university of those mm -hmm. stuff, it's fine. But I don't know if you have a different experience, Anna, or more information. I think that I've seen a lot is like, 
Wikipedia is very like also like a summary of all those web pages. Like you see someone and then you see like they are literally the same. There is literally the same information that in the web pages. So something like for that, I think would be just like try to change a bit the the structure of the sentence. Uh, and in that way, like it's not the same, but it's still you have like the same content and the same information. Thanks a lot. Something nice that you also, uh, if you can search, like search the name and news in Google. I think that I mentioned, but I'm not sure now. Uh, because like there are some interviews or like about their work and how it was like more impactful in other stuff than just uh, the paper. So something like also as references, newspapers and.
we have five minutes more before the next uh, break. We today we have a lot of breaks because <laughs> we are conscious about <laughs> the high stress of the computer. Uh, and then we will have the um, showcase lighting talks, but I don't know you, <laughs> Francisca and others, but I'm so happy because <laughs> now we have like you are super fast. And most of the bios are very well done. And yeah, please, um, if you have free time, I, I will work also in mine during this uh, month. And then we can uh, edit all. If you want to read the others one, also like to check if something is strange or make a comment as we are a collaborative team. Also, that's welcome. Um, and we will have yeah, this break of 10 minutes. If you also have comments and something else that you would like to suggest for future wiki editations, or so, uh, all comments are welcome. I have another question I would like to yeah. ask. So I was thinking about um, academic service. So first I was thinking what I should write there, then I kind of understand what I should write there, but then I was thinking, should we write this at all? Because I think the majority of these academic service things are done by women and I don't, I'm just writing Catherine Faust and I'm looking what uh, Wasserman has at his page. He doesn't have any academic service. So I was thinking maybe we shouldn't have this academic service thing at all or or maybe you can clarify more what you mean by that and then I would understand better. Is it like organizing conferences or something like that? Yes. Um, ah, okay, oh, she has, okay. Yeah, academic service, but it's like more like, uh, like what do you for the societies more than just your research particularly? So for mm -hmm. example, <laughs> being part of the Society of Wins could be academic service. Mm, yes, okay, I see now. Mm -hmm. Like more those, uh, yeah, all, that is not so it's outreach, right? Exactly. Also, so, uh, also, you can change the name to outreach. I, I just give examples, but yeah, outreach. Okay, thanks uh, a lot. It's more clear now. Be, yes, exactly. Yes. Would be better. Yeah. Okay, another thought I had, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm occupying no, 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 all the worry. space today. Uh, I was thinking, I don't know if you, have, if you have the same, but it's quite difficult to find information. Uh, and then I was thinking that we also should probably, I don't know, be more um, uh, vocal about what we are doing, right? Or I don't know, everyone should have a website when it's everything is very written in, in detail, then it would be very easy to to understand what person is uh, working on. I don't know if you had the same feelings, but that's what I, I felt. I thought like if she would have a, if she would have a website, there will be like many pages. There'll be like a few pages it would be much easier for me. And I don't know, at least in my case, it's a bit difficult to find information because I think she's professor and I don't know actually if she's still active and what is she doing now? So it's a bit difficult for me. I don't know if you had the same feeling I don't know if I'm biased just for this eight that we searched, but like the ones of that I knew before from NetSign, like have more this web page, like their own web page things, while the others are more like in the institutional web page. So yeah, what do you say? It's completely true because you have to read it between lines and then you don't know. <laughs> like you just can say that the person works in, I don't know, biology, but then you cannot say anything. But yeah, that's a good point for future. If one day we have our own Wikipedia pages, like that someone can, can read what we do. 
obviously. And that's something that Brooke uh, Vocal like promotes, uh, was promoting in Twitter that we as like early career researchers also should have our own very detailed web pages. And that's easy for people to understand what we do in the future. But, I also think it is, it's difficult, right? It is, I agree with you both, uh, it's difficult finding these references. And that's another thing that actually in the, this paper that I was mentioning before, and, and someone shared it, I think Anna or Caroline, I don't remember who in the chat shared it in some point, uh, this paper talking about, uh, about Wikipedia that came out this Monday uh, as it's a mixed method uh, approach. They use interviews and they have information about the editors and they found actually that a lot of editors has the same problem. So a lot of articles of women who are deleted, they are deleted sometimes because they say, oh, your reference is not so good, but we don't have so many references to point it out. So it's again, a loop. So it's super difficult. And maybe it's a good point, Dilara, to just work on it and maybe trying to do something in wings about it, like trying to teach how to get this information out. Uh, I have no idea how, but maybe we could do something about it. I think also uh, for those that are very hard, we can like reach uh, them. Yeah, uh, that's what I was thinking about. That's the easiest option, right? Yes. Yeah, they should know where are where is their information and like what else they can have there. But I think that's true. Like what Francisca was saying, like we can have a like something for um, for teaching and learning how to like sell ourselves in these web pages and what information we could put would be would be much easier for the future ourselves. Okay, we have uh, this break if you want to use for continuing uh, your Wikipedia editathon or take a break because the lighting talks are coming in nine minutes. And yeah, people, more people is come to see the, the talks. Thank you so much, Francisca. Thanks a lot for organizing. It was lots of fun. I learned a lot. Well, for participating. Because she was moderating the whole <laughs> second session. <of> the same. <laughs> and thank you to all of you because just because there is people passionate about this stuff and trying to do an impact in knowledge, that is that we are actually doing an impact in a slow way in the time as we have so, but we're doing something different. So definitely that's because of people like you. Also in the future, if you have any questions or if you want some advice or anything or some information about this stuff, just contact us. Uh, we're already in Twitter and it's easy to find us, I think, <laughs> or easier than the people in the biographies. <laughs> so definitely you can reach us later on. It's not, this is not stopping in here and that's it. Um, yes, so send an email feel free to do that. And I think we are handing over to the next, who is going to moderate in the next session? Alice, okay. So <laughs> we are going to just unmute ourselves and it was a pleasure to have been with you all in the Wikipedia editor form. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Francisca. This was this was really great. I learned a lot. Um, I think actually, as, as you were going through the the 
the things of what to do and what not to do in the article. I definitely made some edits and comments to the to the draft that I already had. And there's, there's more work to do there. Um, so I think um, if I'm correct and on the schedule, we're going to start the lightning talk session at 10 past the hour. So according to my clock, we still have 15 minutes to relax. I'm going to have a, a small breakfast, but um, if any of the speakers for today's session are already here, you're welcome to um, press your slides, press your microphone, just go ahead and do it. I was standing up and I saw the comment of Carolina. <laughs> I definitely agree with you. That's amazing. Uh, definitely we can do something like that uh, on our dissertation support with uh, networking science too. Um, yeah, we are going to save that idea. And if you want to do something, so we can do something together. Thanks Carolina for that comment. resume the recording now and um, we can get started with the lightning talk session. So our first speaker is going to be Mariana Macedo um, and Mariana, Ma Mariana you can uh, take the stage already. She's a, a, a PhD student at the University of Exeter and um, uh, yeah Mariana the stage is yours. I'm excited for your talk. Alice, I think you didn't start the record. And now I'm resuming the recording. Did anybody see a message about that? No, I didn't see it. Okay, so I will trust you. <laughs> okay, so hello everyone. My name is Mariana Macedo. I am a PhD student in computer science at the University of Exeter. Our work explores the gender patterns in the urban mobility of the three metropolitan areas, Medellin, Bogota, and Sao Paulo. But why do I study mobility? So human mobility impacts several sectors of society, such as health, security, economics, and social science. So this is true because it's through mobility that we fulfill our demands, such as work, go to the gym, and buy groceries. In this presentation, mobility is the displacement between locations and zones, but in urban areas. Historically, cultural constructs have imposed women and men to different roles in society. So such roles affect how each gender participates in the labor market. Um, occupations associated with caring, like nursing, are frequently occupied by women and high level positions associated with leadership and high wages are frequently occupied by men. In this way, as women are not majority in STEM related jobs, the concentration of these job sectors will present higher travels to work performed by men. So women and men display different patterns in mobility because they are imposed to take different decisions and different roles in society. For instance, in some countries, women tend to work closer to where they live, mostly because of carrying duties or lack of public transportation. Indeed, women are more likely to accept lower wages than men because 
of constraints in their mobility. Women are more likely to take into account their safety on public or private transportation. And what happens is that women are less inclined to travel at early morning and night hours. Looking at another aspect, the socioeconomic classes, we see that they also have an impact on people's decisions. So higher the income, longer will be the distance traveled in some countries such as Denmark or UK. The higher the income, higher accessibility to different resources such as mode of transportation. So in this way, people belonging to different genders and different socioeconomic classes will probably take different decisions in mobility. And this is the case because they are imposed to different roles and they have a different set of resources. In this presentation, uh, we are not comparing any biological difference between people, but we want to take into account that we uh, have decisions differently because of cultural constructs. So nowadays, the majority of decisions from the governments and, and stakeholders are based on the aggregated patterns in human mobility, oversimplifying the peculiarities of mobility patterns. So our work tackles exactly this issue. So how to consider the inequalities and differences in mobility? What actually are them? And how can we uh, have regulations and interventions to have better solutions to everyone? So now that we understand that women and men are imposed to different roles, uh, and that can be translated in the labor market and in mobility, let's put this idea together. So, each gender and socioeconomic class can be influenced by social uh, cultural constructs, available modes of transportation, city development, and spatial distribution of opportunities, such as job or education. So our hypothesis here is that there are gender and socioeconomic differences in the concentration of travel, and that taking together gender and socioeconomic dimension, the mobility differences are intensified. So we, are, we argue that the spatial concentration of mobility is a proxy to understand the spatial landscape of opportunities and that inequalities in the job sectors will be translated in the mobility dimension. So here we study the spatial concentration of mobility in three urban areas, Medellin, Bogota, and Sao Paulo. So in our work, we see that in general, Travels performed by men are more evenly distributed over the areas. As we can see on the density plot for Sao Paulo, the areas are mostly colored by green, which indicates that the majority of the areas are more likely to receive travels by men than by women. Uh, moreover, some regions on the city center have similar likelihoods uh, of receiving travels performed by both genders. When we look at the socioeconomic classes, we see that the upper class are more likely to concentrate their travels in a small set of zones where areas are in a strong blue in the plot. And that travels for middle class are more evenly distributed over the zones, indicating a high number of areas in green in yellow and in pink. The interesting part here is that when we take into account the social economic class together with the gender, we observe that the gender differences on the concentration of travels become 10 times higher. So in summary, our work uh, shows that men are more likely to travel to work in more different zones than women, implicating that for example, if women are not able to have as many job opportunities closer to where they live, uh, regardless of the cultural construct, they might be in disadvantage. Upper class tend to show a more concentrated pattern of opportunities, which indicates that highly skilled jobs uh, is also concentrated in a small set of zones. Um, socioeconomic differences in mobility for the concentration of travels are much higher than gender differences, 
and gender differences become even 10 times higher when we take into account the socioeconomic uh, dimension. Obviously, what we see here is limited to the three data sets and our goal is to make the claims valid to other data sets and other countries. So thank you so much for your attention. I'm open for questions and please feel free to check our papers on the QR codes. Thank you. One round of applause for Mariana. Thank you so much. Um, the floor is open for questions. I'm you're perfectly on time. Uh, <laughs> let me see. So you can raise your hand and I'll call on you or you can post a question in the chat uh, or indicate there that you'd like to ask a question. Um, I would like to start by asking, uh, so, so your analysis is focused on, on cities and the mobility patterns in there. If you'd move to a more kind of rural setting, do you expect to see similar trends or would you see kind of qualitatively a different picture? Um, so what we see in the literature is that uh, the distances will increase. For example, in urban areas, we usually have shorter travels than rural areas. So this uh, magnitude will uh, shrink a bit uh, for, or you expand a bit when you go to the rural, rural areas, but the differences between women and men until now, they seem to be consistent in urban areas and rural areas. Um, however, my, my paper doesn't show what is happening in rural areas so far. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. So, um, uh, in, in the interest of time, we need to move on to the next speaker. Okay. If you do have questions, um, Mariana is still available in the chat, uh, and you can ask her there, and we'll have um, the speakers available also in, in the break at the end of the session for you to ask your questions. So, um, um, going to our next speaker, it, it's um, Dr. Carolina Matson, and he's uh, a postdoc at Leiden University. Um, Carolina, the stage is yours. Thank you. Ready? Hello, everyone, and um, thank you uh, for for showing up. And I am very, I am, yeah, I am Carolina. I am a postdoc at Leiden University, and I'm excited to be here at the showcase and get the chance to talk to you guys today about real world walk processes on networks. Mm -hmm. So when I say real world walk processes, I mean things like play in association football and commercial air travel, where passes and flights are events that each move something tangible from one node to another. Now, walk processes, especially random walks, are very often used as a tool of network analysis, and that's a little different from what I'm talking about. Temporal network analysis usually focuses on inter-event times and what are called time-respecting paths. Time-respecting paths correspond to uh, all of the many paths that a walker could take through a network. Um, so the yeah, uh, when you uh, with when you're looking at temporal network analysis, you're usually considering walk processes on temporal networks. With real world walk processes, we care more about the walkers themselves, things like their holding time or their observed trajectories. It's no longer so much about the many paths that a walker could take, but about the one single trajectory that a particular walker did take. And in this context then, the walk processes really are the temporal network. The walk is the temporal network. So let's consider some real world walk processes as an example. Probably the easiest to wrap our heads around is air travel. Passengers are traveling between airports over links made up of scheduled routes. These change pretty slowly. The events that move passengers are the actual flights along those routes. The walkers we know are the passengers and the trajectory that an individual passenger takes through this network is their travel itinerary. Now, what's super nice about air travel is that it makes sense to, and it's often possible, to get empirical data on any of these things nodes, links, events, walkers, trajectories. But if you're given the choice, you're, you'd almost certainly want travel itinerary data. Not only then do we know the flights that travelers can take, we know the sequences of flights that they do take. 
not only do we know how many passengers are on a plane, but we can figure out how many passengers are at a given airport at a given time. Trajectory data gives us such a detailed account of the process itself that there's actually a budding subfield of network science coming up to study real world walk processes. But there is a problem. We don't always have trajectory data. Much more common is to have event-based data on real world walk processes. For instance, in the context of association football, uh, soccer, some of you may also know it, um, we would have the nodes would be the players. The We don't see the underlying network, although we know it's there. Defenders often pass to midfielders who pass to strikers, et cetera. Uh, the events, though, are, are very clear. Uh, passes are what move the ball, which is the walker. And then trajectories would correspond to possessions. Possessions are cool. They are studied closely in, in uh, sports science. But data on matches is collected about events. So if we want to go from one to the other, we need what we've been starting to call trajectory extraction. So let me show you how that works in this case. So we're looking at match event data, and it's ordered by time. So I hope you'll agree that it's pretty straightforward to draw this example here right in this particular case. You have a free kick followed by a pass, then a touch, and then a shot. But then what? If the next event is a clearance by the other team, this could be the start of a counteroffensive. But we're going to need to incorporate some. <laughs> I'm going to need to incorporate some kind of context in order to know that we wouldn't kind of. There's no way to automatically know that, right? So that's what we've done. Uh, we did consult the rule book and we did consult the sports science literature. We've defined systematic bounds for when this passing process starts ends and restarts, specifically whenever play is interrupted or the ball is turned over to the opposing team. So with that, we can uh, extract trajectories and do some trajectory-based network analysis. Specifically, we're gonna look at Markov order. And that's because Markov order has kind of a neat interpretation in the context of passing dynamics. Zero with order dynamics would be like preschoolers paying, playing football, ball just kind of like jumping uh, from place to place. First order would be what we more normally think of as a uh, as a um, passing network where you have uh, yeah, just defenders often pass to midfielders, etc. You would model this as a random walk on a network. And then second order would be where uh, players somehow end up taking into account who they receive the ball from and who they pass the ball to. You would model that using a walk with memory. So we're going to use uh, this citation over here, uh, PathPy, to calculate the Markov order for a bunch of different teams uh, who played in the 2017-2018 season in Europe. So we did this, and the results are kind of bigger than I even expected them to be. It turns out that many of the most competitive leagues in Europe, uh, most competitive teams, um, play with second order passing dynamics. So we find that um, things are predominantly first order, but then there are these uh, exceptional club teams who play with second order, those in bold. Now, there's several possible explanations for this, perhaps ingrained training of multiplayer dynamics, greater creativity in play, less interference from the opposing team. We don't really know, which means um, <laughs> we should be doing more of this. There's clearly something about the uh, dynamics of passing play that is related to the success of teams, and it can be quantified in this way. So we should be studying real world walk processes in this way. And trajectory extraction makes it possible in many cases where it wasn't possible before, such as passing dynamics. That is my concluding thoughts. So I'm going to put up my contact information up here for a moment as I let you read these rankings for a bit more. It's kind of endlessly fascinating, I find it. One round of applause for Carolina. Thank you. This was this was really fun. Um, and again, we have we are perfectly on time and uh, have time for uh, one or two questions. Yes, so I have a question. Thanks, Carolina, for that. It was amazing. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. <laughs> uh, I was wondering if you have any difference by countries, because I saw that you have Spain, Italy, and everybody has different styles of 
playing football. So I can imagine if you translate this kind of measure uh, to South American countries, for example, they play more creatively <laughs> rather than follow patterns. So <laughs> I was wondering right. if you found something like that in, in this uh, countries specifically. Yeah, so it would be so it would be super fun if if second orderness uh, refer would refer to like how pretty the football is. That would be that would be exciting. Um, when we looked at the uh, world at the World Cup, there kind of there were not enough matches to get the kind of statistical significance you need to bump something something up to second order. So all of the countries were uh, were first order, but. Um, I'm trying to partner with somebody who does who does who does actual sports science and might have an idea of, of these actual things uh, to try to dig a little closer into what these second order patterns are. But for now, it's just a fascinating, uh, fascinating empirical result that anybody could try to explain if they want to. Brooke can confirm that there's zeroth order like in the garden soccer. Um, I have a question here at the Women in Network Science um, uh, uh, satellite. Uh, do you have data that you can do the same um, analysis for the women's soccer leagues? Um, unclear. Perhaps that would be that would be awesome. Um, we were using uh, data that was published in a in a data descriptor in 2019. Mm -hmm. um, it could push them to to try to do that also for for women's soccer. That would be a great idea. Um, I, I think it would be really interesting because the kind of hierarchies of teams is very different for for women than for men. Like the American women's soccer team is extremely successful um, internationally, right? Yeah, and it might be that they that um, women have kind of consistently different uh, passing passing dynamics, like mm. that just for for reasons of play. And it would be super interesting to see if there was a way to quantify that. Uh, this is a young subfield trajectory-based network analysis. So one day. OK, so um, with that, I think we need to uh, close uh, this yeah. talk for the interest of time. There's an, another question by Leonie. Maybe you can um, ask that in the chat and have a discussion there. Um, Happy to take further questions in the chat. I'm going to um, ask Sophia Sador to uh, uh, get to the stage uh, and set up her slides. Uh, Sophia is a PhD student at the University of Greenwich and is going to talk about weighted and normalized gold Fernandez brokerage, uh, brokerage measure, measure. So um, take it away, Sophia. Thank you so much and welcome everyone. I will present this joint work with Zenzu, Matthew Smith, and Sarah Gorboni. In this paper, we we'll look at how to measure brokerage on weighted directed graphs. And I will answer this question first by looking at the motivation, then introducing this new measure, weighted normalized Gold Fernandez, that I will refer to as WNGF. Then I will look at the application to real life data and finally introduce the results. So, what is our motivation? We are doing this paper because we wanted to measure brokerage on weighted graphs, but found that there is a lack of measures suited to analyze weighted and directed graphs. So what is brokerage and why does this matter? Why do we even want to measure this? Brokerage is connecting otherwise unconnected actors or groups. And usually the broker has some kind of benefits when they bridge these structural holes, either in terms of information, power, or economic activity even. So what we did is we turned to an existing brokerage measure that's called Gold Fernandez Brokerage. Um, and it's basically a local measure that considers the incoming and the outgoing neighbors and their group memberships. It categorizes brokerage into five different roles. You can see in the first column, coordinator, gatekeeper, representative, itinerant, and liaison. In the second column, you can see the visualization where the square is the broker, the circle is the neighboring node, and colors represent group membership. So let's see two examples of what this means. In in, when you look at the coordinator, you can see that there is only one color, meaning that both the broker and both neighbors belong to the same group. In terms of the gatekeeper, you see two colors, meaning that the incoming node is from a different group so there's different information coming in to a new group. 
So this is an existing measure that one then we turn and, you, and extend on to incorporate weighted measures. And we do this in a way that for each, um, for we look at the minimum of the transaction flows between the node considered, so the potential broker, and either neighbor. And if, um, if either of this is larger than the flow directly between the neighbors, then we say that this, this node is going to become the broker. We also normalize this measure simply because the group member, the number of group members might differ and we want it to be comparable. So now we have this measure and we want to apply it to real life data set. And the data that we use is called Euroradio, which is a regional input output table between 2000 and 2010 that's available for the EU 24 countries in the NUTS2 level. We use this data, um, one, one table of the data in 2010 and concentrate on the manufacturing sector. So in the end, we have a transaction matrix that we turn into a network where nodes are regions and they are connected to each other if there is manufacturing trade happening between them. And in this network, we want to see how our WNGF measure is performing and we will compare it to other existing measures. What are these measures? Generally, what you would have to do is you would have to dichotomize the network either by introducing a threshold or ex extracting a multi-scale backbone. So these are the two measures that we will compare to. And we will make this comparison through an empirical cum cumulative distribution function. This ECDF function orders all of our unique observations so of how often a, a node becomes a broker um, and then calculates the cumulative probability for each as the number of observations less than or equal to the given observation divided by the total number of observations. So this is what you can see on this figure. You can see the five GF rows and you can see the three measures. In blue, you can see the threshold network at 10%, purple, the backbone at 0.4 alpha, and finally, our new WNGF measure in red. And for three of these me measures, these three, you can see that our measure is clearly performing the best because it is the closest to uniform distribution among the three. For the coordinator, you can see that even though it's relatively close to uniform distribution, actually the backbone network performs better. But for our last measure, you can see that even though it performs the best among the three, it's still pretty far from a uniform distribution. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to see what this means in terms of ooh, sorry, <laughs> information retention and concentrated on one brokerage role, the coordinator role. So when a region brokers between other regions within the same country. And you can see this, the three networks, the three comparisons again, First, for the 10% threshold. And what you can see is there's very little variation. Most of the regions become complete brokers, meaning that they become brokers among all of the, the regions within their country. So it's not performing so well, it's not showing us a lot of variation. Then we have the backbone network, which is a bit better. We do see variation in terms of color already. But, we, but what we don't really see is variation within country. So for example, here, if you look at Portugal, it's the same country. But even if you look at Spain or France, they are very similar in their, in their colors. And lastly, we have our measure, the WNGF, where still you can see the variation in all of these colors, but you can also see within country variation. Generally, you can see one region in every country that performs a lot better than the rest of them. So for example, Mazovia for Poland or Budapest for Hungary. So this is our measure. And the main takeaway message that you could take home with yourself is that there is this new brokerage measure, WNGF, which you can use for weighted, directed, and even complete graphs. And this provides a richer network analysis. It also takes advantage of the large amount of digital data and ensures relevant information retention. And lastly, it's freely available to use. 
Thank you very much for listening, for the opportunity, and for my mentor, Tiziana. A round of applause for Zofi. Uh, thank you for this talk. Um, again, if people have questions, put them in the chat or um, raise your hand. I'm going to open the list of participants to, uh, to see who's got their hands raised. We do have time for one or two questions. Um, and uh, as people gather themselves, I'm going to start us off with one. I was, oh, there, there is one, so I'm not going to hog the stage. So, um, uh, Mariana, do, uh, do you want to go? Um, sure, sure. I was wondering what are the limitations of your metric? Yeah, that's a very good question. <laughs> so I think the limitation is that this, so for example, what I'm showing here is a, a complete network. So by definition, by the general definition of brokerage, you wouldn't find any brokers because everyone is connected to everyone but we still come up with a brokerage measure for them, which kind of serves as a, as a weaker definition of broker. So still there is going to be, or we believe that might be a lot of importance if you're per, um, connected in a, with a stronger weight to another node. But basically I think the big limitation is that this is not as a strong definition of brokerage as, as um, connecting otherwise unconnected actors, because in this case, they are obviously connected. Thanks for the question. Thank you. So if there's no further questions, um, oh wait, there is one by uh, Agnes. Uh, do you wanna go ask it yourself or I can read it for you? Okay, I'll just, I'll just read it. How sensitive is your measure to the unit of analysis? You used here regions, what would happen if you were to use countries? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I, don't, I don't think that, so usually IO tables, input output tables are, um, the unit of measurement is countries, but I believe that it would provide similar res results. So I don't think there would be a big difference simply because what matters is how diverse the edge rates are. And in this case, there would, you would still see that some countries have really small um, trade, trade connections with other, some countries, while other countries are obviously going to have a lot larger connections. And I think it's the same with regions. So I don't really think there would be a big difference if you change the unit of measurement. Thank you, Agnes. So in the interest of time, we need to move on to the next speaker, but there are more questions in the chat. I think it just takes people a few minutes to wrap their head around every new topic. Um, so Sophie, please have a look there. And in the meantime, um, uh, Margaret, could you uh, come to the stage, share your slides? Excellent. Yep. Um, thank you so much um, for the intro, um, for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Margaret M. I'm an assistant professor um, at the Department of Journalism at University of Illinois. Um, it is my honor to uh, share my latest research on internet geog geographics to all of you. This is a collaborative work I did with my colleague Harsh Tanija. Um, so this year, um, the World Wide Web celebrates its 32 years old birthday. So in the last decade, the number of internet users have increased the tenfold. Almost every country internet penetration rate have substantially increased. So internet come with a promise to create a more united world facilitating idea to tra travel across the cultural boundaries and geographical distance. But at the same time, when more rational focused web content in one preferred language are available, user might have less uh, incentive to explore foreign country website, which in turn could lead to a more segregated world. So given with this um, possibility, it's still unclear how homogeneous our global web use pattern 
and what factor really explains those um, similarity or dissimilarities? So our very simple questions for to make all of you to think, um, which countries have the most similar web use pattern as the United States? Um, I think some of you may instantly have an uh, answer in your mind, but let me give you a hint. This is an Asia countries. Um, so I will give my answer uh, later um, in my talk, but you can also feel free to, if you have any answer in your mind, you can put it in the chat box. So in order to investigate the global web use similarity, we collected the top 100 websites for 174 different countries from Alexa, a web analytic companies in July 2018. So here is an example of top website for United States, China, and South Korea. We imported the ranked bias overlap measure, RBO, developed by Rapper and his colleagues in 2010. Um, this RBO similarity matrix is an advanced measure that considers both the ranking positions and also the overlap kind of items in each country's vendor list. So for example, YouTube is a common website at both um, higher ranked position of United States and South Korea, while Facebook is a common website for United States and China, but the site is at a high low ranked position. So the web use similarity um, score between the United States and South Korea are much higher than that between USA and um, China, which is just only 0 0.09. Um, we then analyzed the global web use similarity using a leadward approach, treating the country, the 174 country as nodes, and the uh, RBO similarity score as weighted the ties. So here is a histogram figure present the weighted degree um, of the lag word. Um, the Gini coefficient is low, so it shows no particular country stood out at exceedingly similar to most other in terms of their web use, um, website usage. But country with a higher weighted degree, a country with web pattern are more similar to the rest of the world. As you can see, country in the Caribbean have highest weighted degree beginning with Barbados and Brilis. And then the United States ran the 10 among all the country studies. In contrast, um, Iran and Turkmenistan were country with lower weighted degree, mean they are less similar to the rest of the world. Particularly China have the lowest weighted degree uh, among the country studies. The next step we did is to perform a hierarchical cluster analysis um, and generate a dendrogram we can see that um, for China from the very beginning, it already isolates itself as, a, as its own group. So this is quite expected because Chinese government have to bulk access to many foreign websites um, with a digital um, great firewall. We also uh, create a cryopath path world map to interpret the cluster and their geographical spatial uh, patterns. We study how the world look like when the web use similarity is divided into two cluster to as many as um, 30 clusters. So this method hint that the global web use um, manifests as a mosaic of regional cultures composed um, of geographically adjacent and also linguistically um, similar countries. We go on to examine what factors explain this kind of similarity. We study the effect of language compositions, English preferences, and also uh, whether a pair of countries shared um, a border. One factor to consider is the difference between the internet market site of a country pair. We suspect that uh, for a country that with a smaller domestic internet market, their local internet um, market may not be well developed to produce their own localized um, content. So most of the um, resident or citizen in the smaller country may have to uh, we set, uh, we have to um, search for information or follow a website that um, created by those like in the larger market. We also pay attention to the effect of United States and China. Um, as the world system theory say, the United States have enjoyed a long-standing advantage in exporting cultural products globally. Um, and conversely, uh, for China, which have the digital great firewall, it may have a negative effect on their global web use of similarity score. 
So uh, we um, use QAP to evaluate the significant predictors is explaining those like pairwise similarity between countries web use, free factors are significant, um, language composition and sharing a border are significant events. And this is likely because there are more um, frequent interaction between people and goods for country which share border and speak similar language. Um, different between internet markets, I also have significant effect, which is also what I say, country with um, bigger internet market normally are more self-sufficient, their domestic online ecosystem is much larger. But country with a smaller internet market site would more likely to rely on foreign websites. Um, so back to the question that I asked earlier, which country has the most similar web use pattern um, as the United States? Let me see the check. Okay, so I couldn't see any um, correct answer, but the answer in Singapore. Um, so although Singapore and United States are not really share the border, but those two countries are sharing a really similar language composition among their population. And Singapore has a relatively smaller internet market, which just have three millions people. And um, so it's more likely to uh, follow website from the rest. Um, so this is my um, quick presentation. Thank you very much, Margaret. One round of applause for Margaret. Um, I, I love the quizzes. Uh, and uh, we have time for a question. And I'm again going to give people a minute to digest what they just saw. Um, really cool work with the, with the moving backgrounds and animated uh, uh, pictures. I really like that. Uh, so one thing that I would be interested in is uh, the effect of scale. So you mentioned that Singapore and, and the US were quite similar, even though those two countries are very different in size. So is scale something that uh, has a positive or negative effect or what does that depend on? Is, does it depend, is it uh, important at all? Um, so when we're talking about um, the country scale, I, I would um, think you're talking about the um, country internet market, like the size of it. Mm -hmm. So um, we have our independent matrix regarding with the factor for difference um, for their rel relative internet market site, which is calculate really like the, the differences between the multiples between um, the country populations and also the internet um, penetration rate. So if their differences is smaller, which means both country is pretty similar in market side, their similarity will be lower. But if there's a huge difference, for example, United States and Singapore, their market side is, um, um, the difference will be larger. So their similarity in their web use pattern will also be larger. That is Super interesting and honestly to me kind of counterintuitive. So definitely, definitely something that, that I'll wrap my head, head around. Mm -hmm. So um, in the interest of time, I'm going to say that we move on to our final speaker for the lightning talk session. Um, Jesse, would you like to come to the stage? Oh, and one more round of applause for Margaret, please. Thank you. Um, and our next speaker is uh, Jesse Yaros from the um, from UC Irvine. Uh, she's a PhD student there, and uh, Jesse is on the job market. So, uh, Jesse, take it away. You guys, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so today, uh, thanks for the introduction, Alice. Um, brain. Uh, today, we talk about how brain networks are functionally reorganized to differentially support. Uh, same and other race face recognition. So uh, how did I, oh, and yes, I'm a cognitive neuroscientist at, at UC Irvine um, and a PhD candidate. So, so I got into studying something called the other race effect, which is the tendency to be worse at recognizing individuals outside of one's own race group. And so um, if you've ever heard the phrase, like they all look the same to me or people struggling to recognize people in other race groups, this is, uh, coined by the other race effect, the cross race effect, own race bias. There's a lot of different names for it. Um, but what we do know is that in terms of memory 
encoding, there seems to be some sort of difference in how we process uh, faces uh, relative to the race of, of that face. And so as of yet, there's been no complex systems wide approach to characterizing how brain networks during this uh, memory encoding are modulated by race information. So I had a couple of questions going into the study. Um, overall, in general, how does connectivity in the brain differ when we interact with members of our own and other race groups? And more specifically, uh, are networks organized less efficiently during memorization of other race faces? So to answer some of these questions, I had to design an experiment uh, where participants were in an MRI scanner while they performed this behavioral task. Uh, and in this task, they studied a series of faces and they were later asked whether they had seen specific faces before or not. And the population that I recruited for this study were all East and Southeast Asian based on the people that are available to us at University of California, Irvine. Uh, so we operationalized same race within the study as Asian simulated faces and other race as black simulated faces. Now, the way the study worked is that faces could be directly repeated, in which case the correct answer would be yes, I've seen this face before. Whereas they uh, were also lure distractors, which were parametrically deviated from original faces, uh, such that they were similar, but, but different. And the correct answer here would be uh, no, I've not seen this face before. So the data I'll be talking about today are really spe specific to these conditions where we're looking at the ability to not wrongfully identify a, a face as seen before, which as you imagine can have some relevance within the context of uh, the criminal justice system in mistaken eyewitness testimony. So today I'll be specifically talking about the encoding in the brain. So at study that subserves successful later correct rejections or mistaken false alarms. And so to do this, uh, I first, uh, you know, I had people in the, in the MRI who were performing this task. So I was able to extract the time series from 246 different brain regions for each participant while they perform the task. And then I ran something called a psychophysiological interaction analysis, which determines the statistical dependence between pairs of brain regions during conditions of interest. So I was able to look at, as you can imagine, sort of statistical dependence between all sets of brain regions during uh, encoding that led to successful correct rejections of same race faces and correct rejections of other race faces, as well as later successful correct, or uh, unsuccessful false alarms of same race and other race faces. And you can think of uh, this model is really, you know, you can think of it kind of like a, what I'm looking at is a correlation between time series. In reality, it's actually a, a beta weight describing the variation that one time series can explain in another. And so, uh, you know, after I modeled this, I was able to extract the beta weights for every subject and every condition. And I was able to assemble association matrices for each of these conditions. So this is just exam an example of two of the connectivity matrices for a, a subject of interest. And these were encoding connectivity that resulted in subsequent correct rejections for same race and other race faces. And what I have here is that I have all 246 brain regions against all other, all the same 246 brain regions organized into intrinsic connectivity networks in the brain. And the colors in these matrix represent the warmer colors uh, are stronger connectivity between pairs of brain regions and the weaker or the blue colors are weaker connectivity between brain regions. And so immediately within the subject, you can already see that there's a lot more, uh, there's a lot weaker uh, sets of connectivity in the other race condition. Uh, but to uh, mathematically interrogate this, I constructed graph representations of each condition. So uh, here's just an example for this subject of uh, the top 4% of their uh, edges in this network. So well, the uh, nodes, these are the brain regions corresponding again to the intrinsic connectivity networks in the brain. And the weights or the edges are the statistical dependence between sets of brain regions. And again, even within the top 4% of regions, we can see within the subject some structural differences in the regions most involved in this task. So next, I calculated graph topological metrics to characterize how efficiently these networks were organized during each condition. Uh, these included global efficiency, which uh, really interrogates whether path lengths are between length all, all possible nodes are optimized and how integrated a network is overall, 
uh, basically by taking the uh, uh, average inverse inverse <laughs> average inverse of the shortest path lengths. And then again, I interrogated local efficiency, which uh, really looks at whether removal of specific nodes within a network compromises the ability for that node's direct neighbors to integrate or exchange information. And we can look at that uh, across the entire network to see how fault tolerant a network is overall. And finally, I compared the distributions of these efficiency metrics across my conditions of interest. Uh, so I modeled the each efficiency metric as a linear combination of accuracy and race, those experimental factors, as well as an interaction of the two. And so here is a plot of my local efficiency during encoding uh, that led to, on the left, successful subsequent correct rejections for same race faces and other race faces, and then false alarms of same race faces and other race faces. And what you can immediately see is that in the successful side, uh, there's a much higher uh, local efficiency uh, for, <laughs> for enc during encoding of what becomes successful uh, correct rejections for other race faces. And we see a strong crossover interaction. We see the reverse in the case of false alarms. And so I, I wasn't expecting this. In fact, I, I thought that efficiency of both metrics might be higher relatively in the same race condition. So I was curious, since same race, we usually tend to be better at recognizing same race face, faces, whether this would be supported by a more globally integrated network. And I do see that in general, there is a higher uh, global efficiency in network configuration leading to successful subsequent correct rejections of same race faces. So in conclusion, to answer the question that I originally proposed about whether encoding networks uh, represent other race content less efficiently, the answer is not always. In fact, high localized efficiency may uniquely support successful encoding of other race faces, at least in the context of this study, it did, which may indicate that accurate face encoding may be subserved by discrete topological configurations of functional interactions across the brain when race is a factor. In this subject, all these, all the all the trials were, were randomized. So that sort of a dynamic reconfiguration such that when, it, you know, in certain configurations subserved certain conditions better than others. And so we saw for the other race recognition condition, tight knit and redundantly organized networks that maximize fault tolerance, uh, conserved performance. And, uh, you know, this may indicate because we're not experts in other race faces, there may be certain brain regions that are less engaged. So when networks are overall more redundantly organized, it's possible that when certain regions are offline, uh, this can um, preserve performance. Uh, whereas same race recognition and encoding was observed by configurations that promoted global integration, optimizing how information propagated between all regions overall. And this may be evidence of some sort of expertise effect where all brains are, uh, you know, information is more easily propagated across different and distal networks. Um, and with that, you know, I'd like to thank the organizers so much for, for letting me present here. And it has been really wonderful getting to see everyone's um, just all these different types of, of research using network science. That's very fun. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jesse. Uh, one round of applause for Jesse, please. Um, we're running slightly into the break, uh, but I think we can um, uh, softly transition into uh, asking questions to Jesse and to our other speakers. Um, while anybody who wants to get a coffee before we move on to the next item uh, is, is free to do so. Uh, we have a question from Mariana. Hi, thank you so much. Very interesting. I was wondering if when we recognize other race in the middle of the same race, the result would change. Because I think like if you are um, taking into account a memory effect, you may be easier to memorize things that are more similar to you. Mm -hmm. But when you have a lot of people and someone is different from the overall, maybe it's easier for you to recognize this, this person. Because from computer engineering, when I was a student, mm -hmm. all the professors knew my name because I was almost the only women, woman in the, in, the, in the group. So how do you think would change your, your um, results when you have like several people being recognized mm. at the same time? Very interesting. So, so within a group, you know, where, where there's one group that's, uh, you know, a lot of one category versus 
another person. That's very interesting and absolutely, you know, I think because we do categorize people and especially with other race faces, there's a sort of categorization effect. Um, and, and that is sort of, you know, one thing that sub leads to poor recognition on an identity level, but definitely within a group context, when we can categorize someone that can actually help recognition depending on the, we would call this, you know, the task demand. So absolutely, you know, that's very interesting. And if I were to redo the study and have say 30, you know, maybe 70% same race faces and 30% other race faces, we might see a, a different result. And another thing too, is that because I parametrically modulated faces, I actually made it so that some faces were highly similar to original and some were more distinct. And I actually found that people were better at remembering the more distinct other race faces than the more distinct same race ones. So it's certainly a lot more uh, complex than, than I've presented it, <laughs> but that's a great question. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. <laughs> do you see any and any changes, or do you expect to see any changes if you run this study for a longer period of time, so that people get better at the task mm -hmm. as you ask them to do it several times? Yeah, yeah. Um, so in terms of like task learning effect, uh, I think in general people actually got worse because this is a fatiguing task. You know, in an object recognition task where information is a li little bit more distinct. Um, I found, you know, my, my lab does mostly object recognition. Um, I think that's more engaging. Faces, it's an interesting type of task where we're, every category is the same. So you can imagine it's like trying to recognize differences between different chairs, but we're an expert in the category. So I think it's honestly more fatiguing. But I would think across, if I did it across different days, there would be a relative task effect that might have a down, you know, a sort of degradation in performance along the actual task duration. <laughs> But it would be interesting to look at how that's modulated. We might see an increase in other race recognition because there are studies showing that you can train up uh, to learn other race faces better. So I would think that if someone were to take this task, you know, over a week, say that their performance at same race might stay more stable, but other race might ramp up probably because they'd recognize it's a little bit more difficult and might try harder. <laughs> Yeah, that's super interesting. It, it definitely meets the match of some of my, my personal experience of kind of moving to different places mm -hmm. that have different um, kind of um, demographic yeah. uh, uh, makeups and, and getting used to, to that. Yeah, and the first, um, I know, as do people, I don't want to take the, if it, uh, the stage, so I'll stop talking in case anyone asks other things, but if no one wants to say anything, I have other comments. <laughs> Um, we can also take it to the to the chat. Um, I think um, let's let's have uh, like a minute of a breather or two because in two minutes we get started again with the next item today, which is going to be uh, Cassidy Sugume Azuki Lotus Park.
I was just checking to see if everything was working with sharing Ellis. So, you know, if you That's need great. to kick, just... kick me off, you can go ahead and, you know, no, other slides you want to put up. But... <laughs> no other slides. You are you're the, the main event now. So um, I don't want to take away any of Cassidy's time. I want to hear as much from her as possible. And I know she's got a lot to say. I am absolutely thrilled that we have um, uh, Professor Cassidy Sugimoto here. She's a professor and chair at the School of Public Policy at Georgia Tech and the president of the International Society of Scientometrics and Infometrics. Her research expertise is broadly situated in the domains of science policy, scholarly communication, and scientometrics, and she investigates the ways in which knowledge is produced, disseminated, and rewarded with a particular interest in issues of diversity and inclusion. Um, so I'm super excited for today's talk. Take it away, Cassidy. Thank you so much. And I want to echo what Jesse just said about how fabulous it is to be able to have this fantastic group of scholars together with their, you know, diverse interests, but all of these threads going through, whether they're methodological or thematic. Um, and it's it's really just a beautiful thing to see. I love being able to see all these faces. And I think that's a testament to the work that the organizers for uh, Women in Network Science have done, um, not only in this event, but the mentoring event and all of the other things. So today I'm gonna to talk about the institutionalization of gender disparities in science. But I think the kinds of events that were happening right now are the reversal of that. They're institutionalizing equity. And I think that that is so essential. And I'm just delighted to see what's happening here and. I'm happy to, to help and just honored to be here to talk. So I'll sort of start just with a brief thing about my interest areas. Um, Alice went over some of them, but the kinds of questions that I'm constantly asking is, is access to science equitable? Does everyone have an equal opportunity to participate in science? How do they participate in science? Is the production of it equitable? And then when we evaluate science, when we reward science, when we invest resources into science, is that being done equitably as well? Now, I've looked for a long time at issues of gender, but we've also begun to look at issues of race. And I think it's important to take a moment um, to just do a disclaimer on classifications. We're gonna talk about men and women in this talk, and we're gonna use US racial um, census categories. And those are both fraught with problems. And I will be the first to acknowledge the problems of the binary distinctions of gender, the conflation of sex and gender that happens in a lot of research. Um, when it's unnecessary, and the way in which the racialization of data itself has been problematic and has a very problematic history. But we agree with Ignazio and Klein, um, whose book is fantastic if you haven't had a chance to read it, that counting and measuring don't always have to be tools of oppression, that we can also use that to hold power accountable, to reclaim overlooked histories, and to build collectivity and solidarity. Best and Zuberi also has talked about the racialization of data being both an artifact of these struggles to preserve, but also to destroy racial stratification. So that's the lens in which we're approaching this when we do big data work that is reliant along some of these categories and these classification schemes that are problematic. Our, our goal is to utilize them in order to overcome some of these systemic barriers in the hopes that these classification systems might not be necessary in the future. Um, so that's just a little bit of a disclaimer that, that I like to begin with. So with that said, let's go through the process of science. How does someone get into science? How do they do science? How are they rewarded for science? And are all of those points equitable? Um, so we'll start in the doctoral program. Many of you are in doctoral programs right now. And what we know when we look at doctoral graduates is there is there are several disparities along intersectional lines of race and gender in terms of just the graduation of students in different fields. We see that men are overrepresented in engineering and physical sciences. Um, again, why programs such as WINS are really important in order to promote um, minoritized and underrepresented groups. We also see that Asian populations are disproportionately represented in engineering, particularly among men. When we get to women, we see higher representations in biological sciences and psychological sciences. Um, but again, when we focus on scholars of color, we see underrepresentation across most fields of science with no area in which uh, they are dominant. Now, one of the things that we look at with bibliometric data using publication data as one of our main anchors um, is how much publication data is a predictor of retention in science. 
When we look at those who have published at least one publication during their doctoral study and then after their doctoral study, both are very strong predictors of moving into an R&D career, whether in academe or outside of academe. In fact, academic R&D careers are the minority career paths for graduates of doctoral programs. But in any of those, when we think about scholars staying in and contributing to the scientific record, it is largely predispositioned on the fact of whether they published or not during their doctoral time. And what we see is there are huge disparities between Asian, Black, and Hispanic scholars relative to white scholars and women relative to male scholars in nearly every field. Um, with white and male scholars disproportionately likely to, to publish before they finish their PhD. Now, if you look at the post PhD time, most of those distinctions begin to wash out. So we see that it's a really critical moment there before people graduate, whether or not they have contributed to the scholarly record. And if we take all the factors we can think of, whether they're first generation, if they're in a research intensive university, the fields in which they're publishing, um, we see that one of the biggest predictors controlling for all those factors is whether they have a research assistantship. Now that may seem fairly obvious, but it actually is a really important point. This is determined, this is a, dis, a distinction between a research assistantship or a teaching assistantship or even a fellowship that may come with some prestige but doesn't embed someone in the research experience that's happening at the university. And we look at the distribution of those research assistantships controlling for all of those factors, um, our scholars of color and our female scholars are disproportionately less likely to have our research assistantships, whereas our white, Asian, and male populations are much more likely to have those research assistantships. So this creates a path dependency in the first moments when someone is entering the scientific community. At the moment they're accepted to a doctoral program, we're already creating a path either towards contribution to science or away from it. And so this becomes a very important point that we think about in terms of systemic barriers and how they may not be providing equitable access for everyone to join into the scientific community. So let's say you get through that first barrier. You've come into a doctoral program, you have a research assistantship, you're part of a lab. What kind of work are you likely to do and how might that vary by sociodemographic characteristics? Well, one way for us to look at this is to move beyond the authorship, that is the names on the byline of a paper, and look at contributorship. That is, what did people do to actually warrant authorship on a paper? And does that differ by any of these sociodemographic characteristics? So we take the PLOS data set for this, the Public Library of Science, which has a nicely formatted XML version where we can scrape it, we can process it, um, we can identify certain indicators of gender um, and look at it by contribution type. Now, historically, these were about five different types. We analyzed the data, you conceived or designed the experiments, contributed materials, performed the experience, or wrote the paper, with about 20,000 other categories um, making a minority of types of tasks. Now, in the future, and we'll show a little bit of data from that, they moved to the credit taxonomy, which has far more categories that we can use. So you'll see some results from both of those different um, taxonomies. So looking at just that five grain taxonomy, one interesting thing that we see is if you look at who's contributing to certain tasks and how many are contributing to multiple tasks, the most isolated contribution is performing the experimentation. When you do that, you are less likely to write the paper, to analyze the data, or to conceive and design the experiments. So this creates an isolation space for those who are designing a study, thinking of study and writing it up are disconnected from the experimentation. And if we overlay that on gender, we see that women are disproportionately likely to be the ones performing that experimentation, giving them more isolation from the other spaces. If we extend that to the full credit taxonomy, we see that these are the things associated predominantly with men, supervision, funding acquisition, contribution of resources, conceptualization, the software, the reviewing and editing of the paper, administration and validation, whereas women, are more likely to be associated with the methodology, the visualization, the analysis, writing the whole paper, data curation, and investigation. So we see this bifurcation of tasks where you can see seniority having an effect. But what we also see 
is that whereas men are seen as sort of the resource contribution, the administrators, women are really doing the work of science and the hands of science. Yet in many ways, they're isolated from other kinds of contribution tasks and are often not getting the credit they deserve in terms of dominant author positions like first and last authors where they are underrepresented. Now this distribution of tasks has an effect on their career trajectories as well. So one of the things that we've looked at is how likely these different tasks are to be associated with roles in, in seniority. And of course, performing the experiments is a more junior task, whereas um, you know, contributing tools is a more senior task. But when we put these in certain profiles, we find that those who are associated with multiple tasks and often in leadership positions are very different from those who are specialized or isolated into things like experimentation or in supporting roles such as only contributing resources. And if we place those into it, we find that women are disproportionately less likely to be leaders, but to be in specialized or supporting roles. And that continues throughout the career with women playing this more supporting or specialized role rather than a leadership role. And that has huge implications for attrition. Those who are leaders and particularly leaders early in their career are more likely to stay in science and continue to be a leader whereas specialized and supporting roles often get tracked into those roles or leave science altogether. So again, once we get into a doctoral program, we may see some of these disparities, but then how we're tasked with certain roles and labor on the team is going to change our trajectories in science as well. So let's imagine you've gotten in, you've gotten your research assistantship, you've been placed in a leadership role on one of these teams, and now you go to submit a paper. What happens? Um, well, we'll take a case of eLife, a large biomedical um, open access journal, which has a very interesting form of peer review, a consultative peer review, where all the peer reviewers know each other, they discuss, and they come up with a consensus review report, which they provide um, to the researchers. Now, there are two stages of review for eLife. The first is sort of your desk reject, your gatekeeper role, um, where you're either encouraged to submit a full manuscript or not, and then it goes into this consultative space. Now, most things are rejected at that gatekeeping point before they're ever fully reviewed. About 75% of things get rejected there. And then about 50% of things get rejected the next stage in this consultative peer review point. But if we look at each of these cases, women are significantly less likely to be encouraged, that is to make it through the first point of entry or to be accepted, which leads to a difference in the overall acceptance rate. Now you may see, okay, a difference between 13 and 15% is not a lot but that's actually a pretty large percentage and compounded over time and across women that has effects for careers. As sort of the joke goes, the best predictor of being accepted to a journal is having been accepted before, right? So we see that there is a Matthew effect even in individual careers. And when women are less likely to be accepted at the onset, they're less likely to be accepted further on as well. Now, this is particularly problematic when women are in corresponding or last author roles, where we might argue that their gender might be more known to the reviewers themselves. But what we found really interesting was looking at the homophily in the peer reviewer teams. So would it matter if the composition of that team changed? And so what we looked at was whether you had all male reviewers, all female reviewers, or if there was mixed gender in the reviewing team, that team that was consulting with each other, who was aware of each other, um, and who would be aware of each other's identity as well. Now, given an all-male reviewer, men were significantly more likely to be accepted. But what's interesting is that you can see the mirror image of that for all female reviewers, with women more likely to be accepted. Now, this isn't significant, but this is largely a function of sample size. There were only 21 cases in our data set where women were subject to an all-female review team. The probability of that happening within the biomedical sciences is still fairly low. And the effect fell out when you looked at a mixed gender team, suggesting that heterogeneity had better outcomes in terms of equity for peer reviewing. But if we take all the factors and we sort of look at them all together in a thing, we see that there are two big predictors of just making it through the door. Being from a top institution is the highest loading factor, followed by being male. Now, once you get through the door, being from that top institution, being male, and having all male reviewers is your biggest predictor of success, which demonstrates that there's not equity in the review function as well. When those kinds of attributes are coming into consideration, once you control for all other factors. Now, one way that we can 
change that institutionalization is changing the gatekeepers themselves. We found that when you had a female reviewing editor, you were much more likely to create teams that were mixed than when you had a male reviewing editor. People tend to select reviewers that look like them. So females are more likely to draw upon other females, male upon males. And we see the same thing at the country level with homophily happening in there. People from the US will draw from the US. People from China will draw from China. And what we find is if you're a Chinese author um, and you submit something, you are far more likely to be accepted if there's at least one Chinese reviewer. But given the probabilities of all of these things, it is much more likely to be a male author from the US reviewed by other male authors from the US than any of those other intersectional categories. So we have to be aware that while the homophily bias might work uniformly across all populations, the probability of having homophily is not equal across all populations. So all of these things together lead to some massive gender disparities in production. If we look at all of the authors on all of the bylines, in data from the last decade in web of science. And we look at the proportion of men to, to women productivity by country. We see that in almost every single country, um, men are disproportionately overrepresented compared to women. The global rate is about 30% uh, women production to 70% men production. The very few countries in which we have more women production than men are countries that have experienced high degrees of brain drain, where many of the men have left the country for resources in other country, um, and also have high degrees of male mortality, places that have been plagued by war, um, famine, and other issues where men are not as productive in science, either due to mobility or morbidity. Um, those are not policy actionable. That's not a movement in the right direction to see that where women are doing well is actually where science may be undervalued or be underperforming. Now you may say, okay, but web of science is going to overrepresent certain disciplines which tend to be male dominated. So if we just focused on a few disciplines, we would see something different. But when we look across the spectrum of disciplines, we see that men dominate in nearly every discipline, um, except for a few within the health professions and social sciences. Those that tend to be um, operationalized as care disciplines, nursing, social work, speech and language pathology, education, library science, those tend to be the places where you see predominantly more women. Those also tend to be the occupations that are devalued in the marketplace and in academe as well. Now you also see differences in the way in which collaboration is happening. If you look at all the production of countries, of course, smaller countries more likely to have more international collaboration, Switzerland and the Philippines, for example. Countries with large scientific infrastructures like China and the United States have more national production. But what I find fascinating is invariant of country size, women's production tends to be more domestic, whereas men's is more international. And that access to international colleagues and resources and networks has a huge effect on the reward structure of science, women's mobility and their ability to participate in international funding schemes and opportunities. And we also see that when we look at the intersection between race and gender using data just within the US and US census data, What's fascinating to me is that when we look at last and first authors or all co-authors, um, we see a lot of homophily in the composition of scientific teams. Hispanic men, Hispanic women are more likely to work um, with Hispanic men and women um, than with men or women from uh, different race or ethnicity classifications. Um, and, but what we find is even within that, men are more likely to form teams with other men and women with other women, with the exception of Asian scholars who tend to have a stronger uh, racial homophily than gender homophily, collaborating more with other Asian men and women rather than focusing within all women or all male teams. And this construction of teams, again, is going to have different effects for the larger marketplace. So in all of these things, we see systemic segregation and barriers to entry to science, where we have different levels of entry to it and then ability to be productive within it. And these have effects for the reward system of science. So if we think of citations as sort of the currency of academe upon which you can get rewards, we see huge differences by gender across all countries. The lowest cited papers are those that are single authored by women. 
um, compared to men. Collaborative papers receive more citations, but when women are in first or last authorships, those papers are cited on average at a lower rate than male first or last authors. And that is the same is true for international collaborations. Of course, there's that compound disadvantage where women are less likely to be in those international collaborations which receive higher citations. And even when they are, their papers are cited at lower rates. Um, this again is compounded when we start to apply this over uh, race and ethnicity. So using US census data and the likelihood of a surname being associated with a particular race, we see something just absolutely shocking within the data. That as you move along, we see that men in each race and ethnicity classification um, are on average cited higher than their female counterparts. But as a name becomes more likely to be associated with a scholar of color, particularly black and Hispanic scholars um, at 90 and 100% when a name has very indicative sense of race or ethnicity, the citations dramatically drop. And to me, that's one of the most striking uh, demonstrations of this either implicit or explicit bias against certain works. When we can see as the gradation appears, as people reading a name would be more likely to associate it with a certain race, that is when we see a, um, a change in the citation rate that is received. Now you may say, well, maybe you know, women are just not publishing in the right journals. If they were just publishing in Science or Nature or PNAS, you know, they would probably have higher citations. But when we look at this across citations and then the impact factor in the journals in which we publish, we see something striking is that men are cited on average higher than women in every discipline that we're seeing here, particularly for first author. But when we look at the journals in which they're publishing, there are many times and in many fields where women are on average publishing in journals of higher impact factors than their male counterparts, particularly in earth and space science and biology, in engineering and in social sciences. Now you may say, well, those are averages and we know all citation data is heavily skewed. Um, so let's take this into deciles and let's move this in. If you look at the lowest impact factor journal and then you move up by deciles of these highest impact factor journals, what would you see? And what we see is that the difference actually grows with the impact factor of the journal. So at the top, at those most selective journals that have two to 5% acceptance rates, that is where we see the biggest difference between the citations achieved by men and women. And to me, this speaks against any kind of explanation of quality differential, right? If men and women's work is getting into these highly prestigious journals, um, it should receive similar citations. We should assume a similar quality based on the peer review structure that's happening there. But what we're seeing is it's harder for women to get in and when they do, their work is not being cited at equal rates. So we see here that the utilization of science, that is the citation of science, um, which demonstrates use, I would say, rather than quality, um, has those established hierarchies and is also very homophilic in terms of how it's citing. And just like in the peer review thing, you are more likely to find other citing scientists who look like you if you are in certain populations than in others. Now, of course, it's not just scientific institutions that we have to talk about here. We also have to think about social institutions and how they play into this entire spectrum. Um, so one of the research projects we've been working on recently looks at parenting as one type of effect that may come into the lower productivity of women or their lower mobility, lower access to certain networks. So we ran a survey um, and we asked people to self-classify. Are you the lead parent? Are you the primary caregiver? Do you share parenting equally with another partner of some sort? It could be um, you know, a, a partner and another parent partner, or it could be an, um, a, your own parent who's engaging in childcare or a nanny, other forms of parenting, or are you a satellite parent? Is someone else the primary caregiver? And now what we would find, which is not surprising given what we know from sociological data, women were more likely to report that they were lead parents and men that they were satellite parents. But what was striking to me is that the majority response from both were that they were shared parenting, that they were engaged in shared parenting relationships. And I should mention that this was all using a sample of publishing authors from the web of science. So these are all scientists who were responding to this survey. So we wanted to really interrogate that notion of shared parenting. So we said, all right, well, what times are you the primary caregiver, right? Weekdays, weekends, daytimes, nights. And what we found is that women were more likely to be lead parents at all times of day. So we thought, okay, well, that, that doesn't resonate now with that majority shared parenting. 
Um, so we looked at that, of course, by their lead or their doer or their satellite. And we started to recognize that women when doing satellite roles were reporting as much primary caregiving as when they were reporting dual roles. The men in lead parents, which is only about 3% of our population, was heavily engaged, but men in dual or satellite roles were far less engaged than their female counterparts. And then we asked dozens of activities. Do you organize play dates, birthday parties? Do you do the feeding of younger children? Do you stay up during the night? Do you do drop-offs? Do you um, bathe your children? Do you put them to bed? What, what do you do? What is your engagement like? And what we found is across all of the categories, women were more likely to be engaged except for one, and that is coaching sporting events. So this becomes a tension. Men are reporting shared parenting, that they are equally engaged in their parenting, yet there's only one activity which distinguishes them and their engagement, which is coaching. Now, my father coached me. It's a ton of time. I understand that engagement, but it doesn't really rise to the level um, of being a shared engaged parent. So what we see here is there's even a perception of women of a kind of a burden, a labor that's expected to be a shared parent or to be a primary paragon. And that same engagement um, is not represented in men's own self-reflection of their own engaged parenting. Now, one of the beautiful things we had in the study is about a third of the participants also were in what we call an academic partnership or an academic household. That is their partner's um, primary occupation was also in academe and they were in academe. So this gave us a sense of sort of that shared labor expectation outside of work. Because one could imagine that if a female was an academic and the, um, the partner was doing something outside of um, academia, maybe the structure, the time schedules caused some of these discrepancies. So we focused in just on those in academic households who said that they were doing dual parenting. And even within that, we asked such question as, my partner takes on the majority of the childcare so I can focus on my career, or I take on the majority of childcare so my partner can focus. And in both this, these ways, men and women agreed that the women were more likely to take on the majority of childcare so that their partner um, could focus on their career. So we see these gender labor roles playing out even within academic households where they state that they have shared parenting roles. And all of this has an effect on their production. Being in a lead parenting role, whether you're male or female, um, leads to lower production of scientific work than being in dual or in satellite. Yet women face a higher penalty for taking on each of these roles, which I would argue is largely because they also take on a larger engagement um, with the kinds of parenting activities that exist, which demonstrates that what we're seeing here really is a sort of a time for time. Were men to take on equal engagement and equal time in the label of child care, um, they would also see those same penalties. So what's happening here is really not a gendered effect, but an engaged parenting effect. Now, we also looked at this on citation. And when we throw everything into our regression, and here are the factors that would raise your citation. Um, being male, taking a short parental leave, having your partner coordinate play dates, don't be religious or celebrate holidays, that takes time off from working, and travel, be away from the home, be away from your parenting responsibilities. Those that lowered your citation were having more than two kids, terrible idea, uh, taking a long parental leave, being primary or equal caregiver, particularly for women, um, having your kids in extracurriculars or having any characteristic that was associated with having young children. So the factors like drop off at nursery school, feeding, putting kids to bed and bedtime stories. So of course I say this tongue in cheek, um, but I think it becomes a really important element. If we think of citations not as quality differentials, which I think enough research has shown that it's not, but it's actually um, about access, about utilization, about visibility. Women's work is less visible when women are less visible, when women are in the home, when they're outside of the lab, when they are not able to travel, when they're not able to engage in these things, when they are removed by taking long parental leaves, their visibility decreases and so too does their citations. So this is something that must be taken into account when we utilize citations as sort of these unequivocal and neutral indicators of merit. Now, as you are probably already imagining, the exogenous shock of the pandemic brings all of this to light and made manifest many of these disparities, which were already existing 
um, but then were exacerbated by the fact that children returned to the home for schooling and that women who were primarily playing these roles in lead parenting now had the extra burden of that. And what we saw is immediately during the pandemic, a decline in female authors contributing, uh, particularly for biomedical research in terms of their contribution of preprints. So we saw a very immediate effect there. The effect though was not seen for last authors. It was seen for female first authors, which are typically those more junior roles. What we saw was a spike in middle authorship, which suggests that women who were doing the labor of a first author were then shifted to middle authorship as they began to take on more of those caregiving roles. But that has huge continuous effects as we've seen from the other things on their trajectory in science. As they're relegated to some of these roles and they don't get the credit for this kind of large labor intensive work that they may have already performed on some of that research but weren't able to fin finish it during the pandemic is going to have cumulative disadvantages throughout their career. Um, one of the other things that I think there's noting, and I'm, I'm attentive to time, Alice, so I see I want to move to questions pretty soon, but I'll mention sort of one last thing, um, is that we saw that they were also less likely to pivot to COVID research. So during the time, during when the pandemic hit, I was at the National Science Foundation, and we were giving out millions of dollars in funding. Um, under the rapid mechanism. But this requires that someone is able to immediately pivot to write a grant proposal during the midst of the pandemic. As one can imagine, if you are um, particularly a woman with caregiving responsibilities, either elder care or child care, your ability to pivot during that moment was gonna be lower. And we do in fact see that women were less likely to move to COVID research compared to their male peers. Now you may say, well, does it matter, right? Maybe it's really good that women are home. Women are taking care of their children. That's a huge societal contribution. They should be doing that. Parenting is responsible. And it shouldn't matter whether you're male or female doing science or you know, black or white, whoever's holding the pipette is irrelevant. But it does make a difference in science. So I will end with um, a study that we did looking at the mesh headings within um, biomedical research. Now, we look to see the populations that were studied, whether you're studying male or female populations. So in biomedical research, uh, sex is often not reported. You may say, well, that doesn't matter, right? They're only using cells, and does the sex of the cell matter? Well, it does, right? The absorption of lipids, the response to stressors, all of those things matter, which leads to the fact that the drugs withdrawn from the market, I think about eight out of 10 of them are drawn because they have adverse effects for women. They weren't necessarily tested um, utilizing or taking sex into account or utilizing both populations in study. Um, because of our knowledge of this, many agencies like the National Institutes of Health and other has instituted sex reporting and the inclusion of both sexes unless explicitly justified otherwise. And you can see a huge rise in increasing um, for both sexes through both clinical medicine and public health. And if you look at this by discipline, it starts to make sense. Gynecology is more likely to employ uh, female populations in their studies, and neurology is more likely to use male populations. But when we start to look at other categories, such as pharmacology and physiology, and the overwhelming study of men within those, it suggests that we don't know as much about women when we're thinking about pharmacology as we do about men, and that has massive effects um, for health. Now, so what we did is we overlaid the gender of the authors on top of that. And what we found is that women were significantly more likely to take sex into account, to report on sex, and significantly more likely to study women. And this was especially more likely when you had both a woman as first and last authors, which simply put says that the more women in science, the more we know about women. They change the topics that are studying. And some of the studies that we've looked at looking at the intersection of race and ethnicity demonstrates the same thing. Looking within health, um, scholars of color are more likely to study African Americans or racial disparities. Hispanic scholars are more likely to study Latinos. We see this homophily in the topics that are studied, which says, suggests that changing the composition of the scientific workforce changes what we know. This is not just a matter of social justice, but this is a matter of research integrity in terms of diversity. So I will end with that. I see Alice is wanting me to wrap it up and I'll just make one statement um, that I think we really do need to work hard on making sure that science 
fits for everyone. And I think you've, you've all heard the anecdote about the, the crash test dummy, um, right? It was only in recent years that we put in a female typed crash dummy when we were testing cars at all. Um, before that, there were just male test dummies. And women are 17% more likely to die in a car crash and 47% more likely to sustain like a very serious injury. Why? Because we don't fit in cars. Cars weren't made for us. So when they made the female cast dummy, they made her think she was five foot tall and 110 pounds and just a scaled down version of the male. And they put her in the passenger seat. And that's how they began to test whether cars. So if you are a woman outside of those dimensions, or if you might be pregnant, or if you're driving, heaven forbid, um, you're not compliant, right? You are not compliant. And science does the exact same thing. Science sets up an ideal worker, and that ideal worker is a certain type of person with certain types of resources, with things happening in the background that allow them to participate in science in different ways than the rest of the population. Um, so lots of ideas for what we can do, but I want to hear from you, so I will um, end there. Thank you very much. One round of applause for Cassidy. This was amazing as always. Um, I have asked Cassidy lots of questions over the last few months, um, so I will not take the stage and we'll leave it to others because I'm sure there's lots of um, uh, questions and uh, points of discussion. So, and we have, we have a raised hand from Jesse. Hi, thank you, Alice. Um, Thank you so much, Cassidy. This is an amazing talk and a horrifying talk as well. <laughs> um, um, a couple of it, well, what I have a couple of questions, but you know, uh, what one being really, you know, I was definitely aware of the whole, you know, the research and resumes and, and gendered and race identifying uh, names that can influence decisions, which led me to at some point be like, should I publish with my nickname because it's a little less clear what right, what gender I am, um, but really what what I'm curious about, you know, and you kind of touch on this is like those names that we publish with, I don't think at the point in which people are like reading papers, they're like going through and being like looking up these names because often it's a, it's, you know, a, a J Yaros, unless it's, you know, race last names are a different story. Right. But I mean, it really is right more embedded in this sort of like societal, like inequities that you mentioned, like the lower visibility of women and, and, and non- you know, in marginalized groups. And so I'm curious, like, what you think in terms of like, what is a way is, how is the best way to like raise visibility and, and boost people? Is it really rely on, you know, the institutions and like our white male counterparts <laughs> boosting us? Like, how do we actually become more visible and like close that gap? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And so you know, people often ask that, should I anonymize myself in the name? But what we see is the biggest discrepancy is actually for the last authors, not the first authors for this, which suggests it's the more senior authors who are more well known, where the gender is known through their own visibility at conferences and other spaces. So my hypothesis is that it had little to do with someone reading a name. Um, and I mean, there is a bit of implicit bias that happens there. And I think that's more the case with the race data, frankly, than it is with the gender data. Um, but just that discrepancy we've seen between seniority is that the disparity seems to exacerbate the more senior you are where the gender, your gender would be more well known, not only from your name. Um, so how do, we, how do we get away from that? I, I do believe, and one of the policies that I put on the other thing is around quota hiring. And I know that that's a very politically sensitive issue. Um, but I do think that you need more women in senior roles. And I think having more women in senior roles changes a lot of these dynamics. It changes the way that this space is happening. Um, now, people often say, well, quota hiring is not based on merit and science should be based on merit. And I say, well, if you believe that, you haven't been paying attention to my talk because it has not been a merit-based um, evaluation system right now. There are equity measures that we can take, I think, to increase women in those roles where they can mentor, they can provide assistance and help other women and other minoritized populations to make it through the role. So I, I do think that that is one mechanism that I think we should utilize more and, and not be so afraid to utilize. Uh, I have a follow-up question, though I, I will shut up if anyone else. Oh, it looks like there's another question, so I'll shut up. 
Thank you so much, Cassidy. It was wonderful. I loved your presentation. So I was wondering, because in a point you said that uh, women are less likely to be cited. And yeah. I was wondering, like, what is the contribution of homophily of being <laughs> cited? Because if I am a man, I collaborate more with men, I would cite more men, and then they are majority. So it's a cascade of a fact. Or um, how much is a gender prejudice, uh, you know? Yes, absolutely. And sorry, I have a, a puppy who's decided to, to eat the garbage while we're, we're talking. So it's my, my work from home moment. Um, so we have looked at, at the effect and that it is part of the effect, the both two things I would say. One is the self-citation bias. So the fact that men cite themselves, like they're not just other men, but they cite themselves more than women tend to cite themselves. So the cumulative effect comes in. But even if we extract out the self-citation bias, then there's that next level of the homophily bias. Um, part of that is that you are more likely to cite your co-authors um, or those within your network than outside of it. So when you already have homophily in your co-authors, then your probability of citing your co-authors compound in the fact that your probability of working with other people who look like you plays into that as well. So it, you can kind of think of self-citation in lots of layers, citing yourself, citing your other co-authors. And because there's homophily in each of those spaces and that men are disproportionately represented, so they're disproportionately likely to be in your co-authorship network, all of those things play into each other. So I think you're absolutely right. That's part of the effect. Um, but even when we've extracted that out, we still see a latent bias um, in there that's happening around gender. Brooke. Hi, Cassidy. Thanks for your talk, um, as always. Um, so I find your work so compelling. <laughs> Um, but now I, as of right today, um, I'm the chair of my department <laughs> um, and I'd love your Congrats. advice. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I'd love your advice for how to implement um, some of the, you know, the findings or the, you know, um, interventions that you might suggest. So, so it's in particular, I'm really worried about the caregiving um, deficit, right? So, so, and the movement into the second author or trailing author roles. Um, for the pre-tenure women in my department. So what do you suggest? I know a lot of people are getting clock extensions that doesn't feel quite right to me. It doesn't like change the author order. Um, so, so what do you suggest for us? Yes, so I have, I have many feelings on the, the clock extension. I think the minute COVID hit, every administrator said, hey, look, I'm taking, I'm taking this into consideration. I'm going to extend the clock. So you're going to take already vulnerable populations and you're going to extend their period of vulnerability with no compensation for them. So the first thing that I would say is any time that you do that, you need to retroactively give them pay increases. So we know that women take longer to each of these milestones, to promotion and to tenure. They have longer times for it. Um, but that means that their compound salary disadvantage um, becomes wider and wider. COVID is going to do the same thing. It's going to extend and prolong, particularly for women and minoritized populations, their time to uh, tenure and promotion, which means that that pay gap is going to come in. So one is providing sort of the retroactive pay gap that they would have gotten before, I think is a really important thing. I think it's also really important to ingest other resources in. What women um, need during this time is not more time away, but more resources to help them, giving them additional TAs to help with grading, giving them a postdoc within the lab, and what doing that can also do is help some of the other issues. This year has been a terrible year for hiring and the people who are going to have a hard time getting on the market, those scholars who were postdocs last year but never actually got into the lab, who have no publications and now need to go out on the job market with fewer publications, that's gonna really hurt them. So being able to sort of identify that and place female postdocs with female faculty members so that they can sort of get that work going, that they can work together and collaborate. I think those kinds of resource investments make a lot more sense to me than providing opportunities to push women further out. Okay, extend your leave, take more time off, have a release. Like, no, release them from other duties so that they can do their research. Um, I think that that's the most effective administrative move. Lots of hands up. Um, let's see. Uh, I think Anna is next. Hey, Cassidy. That was amazing. I have a question with this like information about what each gender considers caring and all the list. 
is there a like a I don't know a correlation between which are their disciplines and which are they aware of what is scary? Like I mean I don't know if you are more social science you know more like caring is not just drop them in and out of the school like caring is more than that. Is there a correlation between disciplines and that's, those? That's a great question. And that's one we didn't delve into. So we, we do have the data on their discipline and I, I didn't look into that. So that's, I, I would definitely do that. That's a great question about that and, and how it may play out. Um, yeah, that's, that's a fantastic question. And I don't know. Thank you, Kasi. And then, so we have the panel discussion starting in six minutes from now, and I know that there's a puppy, so I don't want to take, uh, I, I don't want to say that Cassidy can't take any more questions, but perhaps she wants to step out, get a stretch and, and take care of the puppy before we move on to the next item. Well, I think Agnes had another question. I'm happy to, I'm happy to take them. The puppy has wandered off to chase the kitten. So, I mean, it's a veritable <laughs> zoo in my household. There's always chaos, so. Okay, then uh, Agnes, I think, uh, is the next on the list. Thank you so much for the fascinating talk. It's so exciting and also sad that this resonates so much. Uh, so um, I was pretty, um, pretty happy to hear more about your, uh, we know how important collaboration is mm -hmm. for, for women. And you have some data that shows that regarding credit sharing, women are at disadvantage if they work with men because then they get somehow uh, less credit, but it is important for their visibility to work with men because mm -hmm. then it's, um, yeah, there's supposed to be a boost. So I, I think this, this um, duality is quite interesting and I'm wondering what's your suggestion? How should we collaborate then? Yeah, so, and, and I have so many mixed feelings about all of these, right? So, of course, you can say, you know, going to the center of the network is going to benefit you, and men are disproportionately at the center of the network. So, being with them, but then you deal with the Matilda effect that all the credit will go to that individual rather than to you. So, you're kind of navigating the tensions of that. Um, I think that there's also the space of your ability to navigate a dominant author position within that. So working with someone who's central in the network, but as first author rather than middle, um, is going to be a strength for you, absolutely. What we see in, and we have, we have a new paper coming out, I didn't present any of it on, I should have put it on here. Um, what we see is that men and women have very different ways of assigning authorship and determining authorship, with men more likely to do it unilaterally and to do it at the end of the project. And so the recency effect is really strong. Who just did the last work that got it over the finish line? As PI, they decide on the authorship order and they go. Whereas women are more likely to do it at the beginning and with the whole team in conversation. So you understand what labor role you're going to put in and then the reward that you're gonna get in terms of authorship at the outset. Um, so the, then the primacy effect is stronger there. Um, what I would like to see is more transparency around those conversations in all of the labs. And I think then, then the heterogeneity will work better if women are able to say, I would like to work on this project. My expectation is going to be a first authorship role. If that's not going to be provided, then I'm, I'm not going to work on this project, right? Like any other labor workforce, there should be an expectation of work and what the compensation will be for that work. We know that there's capital associated with those placements. We need to have that conversation and that conversation needs to be more transparent. Um, so that's, it, I know that's not a great answer because it's hard to do, but it means changing the culture of those labs so that authorship comes to the front. And I think part of that is, you know, um, empowering women to have those conversations and be very frank and, and upfront about those conversations when they happen. That would be, that's my response. <laughs> no, thank you. That's great and helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jesse, do you have another question? Thanks. <laughs> So I have a question specific to the biology data that you presented. Um, so as a neuroscientist, I remember when, you know, certain funding agencies, I believe the NSF started requiring, uh, requiring animal researchers to, that they were funding to actually recruit or use uh, female, female animals in addition to male to try to get around this issue. But it always seemed to me kind of odd in that. So I, I agree, like we need to keep learning, but at the same time, there's all this wealth of data relative to male animals and mm -hmm. so when we're just adding in female we're unless you know they're doing female versus male analyses which often they're not you're still not mm -hmm. getting any sort of female specific 
data. And I don't know that I've seen any studies that are really just female rats, just female <laughs> mice. I'm not sure yeah. if you have any, you have any opinions on sort of like mm -hmm. what scientists should be doing in terms of like understanding, you know, what's relevant to the female body and keeping us alive with mice. <laughs> Right. Oh, so many, so many thoughts. Um, I know we have one minute, so I'll make it short, but I have like a million things to say on this. So of course the, the exclusion of women from a lot of these studies um, and, e, you know, has been one about protection, right? Protecting women, not studying them because they are a vulnerable population. When we go to sort of mouse models, it's often the argument about hormonal variability, that women exhibit such high hormonal variability, therefore they don't make good test studies because we have to take into account their ovulation. Plenty of studies have shown that males have a lot of hormonal variability as well, um, and we haven't taken that into account. So we need to kind of first address many of these myths that are coming in of our inability to study that. Now to your question about studying it as sex, I don't think we have to necessarily make thing a, a sex comparator, but I think that it should be in every supplemental that you did sex reporting. What was included? Were there any differences? No significant differences? Great. Now go on with your study. If there are significant differences, we need to understand those. Why did you see significant differences between it? Now, of course, everyone will say you've just doubled the expense. And that is a huge issue, right? You've just made the study twice as expensive as it was. We know that women are funded at lower rates. We know they also receive uh, lower funding. Now, did you just remove the ability for women to do um, sex reporting? So I understand just all of this sort of layered issues that are coming in here, um, given the expense of research, given the access to different things. Um, but yes, I would love to move into a wor world where you take sex into account, take gender into account, even if it's not the focal point of your study. All right, that's my 60 second answer. Thank you so much. That's another round of Capacity. And um, I'm, I'm very delighted to hand over to Marjorie Manat, who will be hosting the panel discussion, which is starting now. Thank you, Alice. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, Alice, should we wait a couple of minutes or should we just get started? Um, up to you. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I haven't saw that the, the participant count, but the people are still dropping in. But I, I trust your judgment. Uh, okay, so I'll just go over a few things and wait for everyone to join. Uh, welcome everyone to the last event of Women in Science Net, uh, Network Science Satellite Session. And we have a wonderful panel today to discuss about gender bias in academia, continuing from the session uh, previously, and what our communities and professional societies can do to address it. Uh, so we'll to give an overview of what you can expect in this uh, discussion. We'll start with some brief introductions and then go over certain questions that we have uh, formulated and we have for our panelists and in the end, we'll have some Q&A session. Uh, before I begin, please type in your questions in the chat or raise your virtual hands and we'll try to answer them in the time we have. Okay. I'll begin by introducing myself. Uh, I'm Madhuri Manath. I'm currently a data scientist at a consulting firm. Uh, I did my PhD from Virginia Tech and I have a statistical physics background. Before joining the industry, I used to work in analyzing graph dynamical systems and uh, epidemic modeling, and I'll be your host today. Uh, helping me out would be Francesca, and I'll, I, I can't see if she's there. I'm hoping she's there. Yeah, uh, Francesca, would you like to introduce herself? And she'll be helping me out with the questions and chat messages. Hi everyone, so I'm doing my PhD in Manchester, in the University of Manchester, and I'm doing it in the Mitchell Center for Social Network Analysis, so very network-related kind of topic. <laughs> so nice to see you all, and I will be here, uh, so any questions or anything, you can just send me a message. Thank you, and moving on to our wonderful panelists, uh, we have Brooke 
Fockelt Willis, a founding member of our Women in Network Science Society. She's an associate professor in the Department of Communication Studies and a faculty member of the Network Science Institute at Northeastern University. Welcome, Brooke. Uh, we have Laura Coeli, the president of International Network for Social Network Analysis, and she is also the senior investigator at National Institute of Health for the Intramural Research Program and the chief of the Social and Behavioral Research Branch at the National Human Genome Research Institute. Welcome, Laura. We have Anne McCraney, the general organization of Networks 2021. She is the associate director at Indiana University Network Science Institute. Welcome, Anne. We have Yamir Moreno, the president of Network Science Society. He is a professor and the director of the Institute of Biocomputation and Physics of Complex Systems at University of Zaragoza. Welcome, Yamir. We have Alice Suarez, the president of Women in Network Science, and she's the postdoctoral, postdoctoral research scholar at University of Washington. Uh, welcome, Alice, again. And we, lastly, we have Cassidy Sugimoto, the president of International Society for Scientometrics and Infometrics, and the professor and chair at the School of Public Policy, Georgia Tech. Welcome everyone again, and thank you all for being here today. And uh, we, I'll just jump on to the questions that we have for our panelists. So with key representatives of several large and influential societies present, let's start with the role that professional societies and conferences currently play and can play in future in working towards gender equality. Laura, your thoughts? Wanted to make sure my mute was off. <laughs> I know our standard language now in these Zoom meetings is you're muted. Um, <laughs> so thank you so much uh, for that question. And I will um, answer in my capacity as the president of INSNA um, and sort of how we've been thinking about this in terms of our um, sort of leadership role uh, in uh, social network analysis. And really over the last several years, we've been quite mindful um, to making sure that we have representation on our, um, on our board of directors so that we have a breadth of diverse voices being heard in terms of the leadership of the organization and decisions that we're making as a board for the organization. Um, one of our priorities over the last several years is really um, being mindful of this representation and uh, creating policies and initiatives that support and engage uh, diverse membership um, and creating opportunities um, for diverse membership to be a part of the leadership of the organization. So we've really been thinking about whether or not we have structural barriers um, to representation and trying to uh, reduce those barriers um, in various activities that are um, available um, to our membership. We have um, been thinking uh, more about sort of the practical um, elements to in engaging our membership um, and providing opportunities for our membership to be a part of um, our um, our annual meetings, for example, and that, of course, has been on pause <laughs> for the last couple of years, given the virtual nature of how we've been meeting as an organization. Um, but there have been conversations, uh, both in terms of our business meeting, um, which engages the membership as a whole, as well as in, at our board level, to make sure that participation is equally feasible for so things like having childcare at conferences, 
having family friendly conferences, um, and then also providing space for groups like WINS, um, like our diversity SIG, um, to convene at conferences and actively supporting um, those efforts. So I'll pass it on to the next person because I can talk for a while. and I wanna give everyone a chance to speak. Thank you, Laura. Yammer, um, you, uh, your thoughts? Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, we are pretty much aligned with uh, um, in, um, more or less on the same kind of measures. Um, we actually had the idea of um, having a committee within the society, not only for women, but also for diversity and minorities in general. It's something that is standby due to this uh, COVID-19 that uh, we uh, were all, you know, um, uh, busy with other things, etc. But this is something that we are surely pushing. Uh, but we we have always taken uh, actions. Um, for example, and we have some prizes and some hours in this hours in the society. Um, we try to encourage submission of female nominations all the time, just to increase the ratio, which is not so really nigh, uh, now it's not 50-50 or it's not so, uh, as it should be. Um, and we are trying to, um, you know, um, try to come up with some solutions to these problems. Like for example, um, we will implement a sort of nomination committee that if we don't get enough nomination of women, this committee will be in charge of looking for potential candidates. Because sometimes it's not a problem that we don't want to give those prizes or awards. It's just that if, if it is nomination based and we don't get enough nomination, then you cannot uh, give uh, those prizes. So what we are trying is to proactively create this sort of a small group of people that will um, look for potential candidates to those prizes so if we don't have uh we don't have to rely on on the community to get the nominations of females and other minority groups uh, in the society uh on the other hand i think that uh, i mean to be a little bit more critic with what we have done i think that we need to do more on the direction of uh, exploiting our capacity as a society to have more influence on at the level of departments, universities, etc. So, I mean, sometimes we, we try to implement all these kind of things within the society, but uh, I, I, we are not happy with um, the fact that we have been unable to exploit our force as a society to go out of the society and also exert some influence uh, uh, you know, not only within the, our members, but also at universities, etc. And this is something that I think that we will look, uh, we will try to to increase in the future. These sort of actions. Um, um, I don't know. Uh, that would be probably one of the of the things that we will ask to this new committee on diversity, etc. To create mechanisms that we that allow us to, you know, reach other places that we normally don't talk to, etc. So this is more or less what we think that we can, that, that what we have done and what we think that we can do in the future. I think that the, the most critical part of the work that we have to do is not within the society, but it's also to reach out the society, which is uh, um, something that we need to come up with solution for that. I'm, I'm gonna pipe up as a, not only as this year's general organizer, but as a conference organizer in general, but also I'm a board member at the Network Science Society and the conference's co-chair. And I've before I was ever involved in NetSci, I've been attending Sunbelt for a long time. Um, and so uh, I've not been, and I've, I've been involved in the running of the national, um, the North American social networks meetings as well. So I have a bit of a perspective of the actual machinery of conferences um, that, you know, is unique unless you've actually been involved in actually organizing one. And one of the things that I've said, and one of the really exciting parts to me about having a joint conference was having Ymir and Laura in the same room and some of the other leaders from the different steering committees actually interact with one another where I, I don't actually know if the two of you knew each other before all of us started or had met. 
And, um, and I know that there were people that were in our steering committee that had their first interactions with one another. Maybe they'd heard names, maybe they'd heard tale, but they had not seen each other because they were not attending the same conferences. And one of the things that I have been very interested in is thinking about how we institutionalize these things within the association or the society, as opposed to making it a part of the local conference. So both of these conferences, so I'm, I'm gonna speak about networks, these two networks conferences right now, both of these conferences have local hosts. Um, now they do them a little bit differently. So it's not the same, but in the net side, side the local host is really largely responsible for the entire meeting. And they really kind of start, they start with our help. I mean, I'm part of that help that people get when they get going, but they really run it from the beginning to the end. And so Ymir has oversight. Um, we also try to oversight and help them with that but they really run it. Sunbelt does a little bit different in that they have a professional staff that's actually assisting with like registration and other things, but local hosts have a lot to play. And one of the things that I think as having been the local host a few times now is that some of these things actually need to come at the level of the association and the society to recognize and support them regardless of who's having the meeting so that the so that the it isn't a recreation and a re-explanation every time that you actually run the meeting and i have a further um thing that i want to see and I, I think you mir and laura have heard me talk about this which is i would really like for these two societies and maybe others too that serve the networks community to actually start not thinking about doing it within their own society but actually doing it and supporting it as cross group efforts because while there may be people who only go to Sunbelts or only go to net size or only to compliments or only go to whatever they go to, um, there are many people who do a lot. And places like WINS and places like the Diversity SIG and other sorts of activities are in the Society for Young Network Scientists are exactly the kind of welcoming spaces in meetings that a local host would love to be able to create, but it's really hard to do that from scratch. But having had a group that exists and can kind of float around well, in fact, they become brokers between network communities that aren't otherwise connected. And that's been, I think in particular, the Society for Young Network Scientists and WINS have a real role and I hope a future. Um, both of them name themselves network science. And I will just tell you that I think that that actually can be a little bit of an issue. You may not realize it, but it can be of an issue in dealing with um, a very well-established social network analysis community. I wanna figure a solution for that out. I don't want to have an argument about it. I guess that's where I'm ready to move forward. And that's the entire theme of this conference is, okay, th this is where we've been. Let's figure out how to move forward because I think that the people that actually are coming and being a part of not only WINS, but also some of these other um, groups, communities actually that are forming around um, identity, that are forming around uh, any number of things, Trans, transcend a lot of this and could be the, and, and like I said, can be the brokers and the connective tissue between our community that we're looking for. So that's my soapbox on this. Um, and I'm not trying to take the responsibility off somebody who's organizing locally, but having the institutional memory, having a little bit of support that comes from the institution or literally institutionalization, having it be a thing that happens is really, really important when you get to planning something and knowing what's going to happen and when. Yeah, I, I fully agree with that. Um, just just an addition to what I said that I, I forgot to say. Uh, one thing that we 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 are also uh, will propose to this committee to consider, but I think that that would be uh, easily uh, something that we can easily do is to uh, move sessions like this to the plenary. Uh, part of the of the conference because uh, I see that uh, many participants are actually women um, and young researchers not so those that can actually exert some influence on the on the academy let's say uh, are not so present right now uh, of course the, I, I'm, I'm not so you know uh, um, saying anything about that it's, it's just that uh, maybe they have uh, other things to do but uh, if this is uh, a plenary session of course not uh, two days or, or, or half a day but at least one hour in a plenary session that could be something that gives more visibility um, and that will perhaps create more uh, momentum towards uh, avoiding this kind of uh, bias in, in conferences and the society so this one thing that would be also on the table 
and one last thing, cause I wanted to, to go off this. One of the things that I have been, uh, I was surprised about, I don't know that I've ever told you mirror this, but pleased with is the fact that the network science society requests all of the speakers that are invited or plenary. And, and if you, if you've been to a net side before, you've known that there are a lot of plenary speakers that happen there. And those are very important for people um, professionally and um, a big marker of um, advancement and up and coming. Um, and they review them and they review them very straightforwardly. Do we have enough women? Do we have people in regional representation? W what are we doing here? We need, I mean, we need to have topic-based diversity of research, but we also need to have this other type of diversity. And it's very straightforward. It is not a, um, it's not a nuanced conversation where we say like, should we, or should we not? It's like, no, we need to actually have it there. Now it does not always work perfectly, um, but it is a frank conversation that values that kind of diversity there. I haven't been in, in the conversations with Sunbelt and Sunbelt and, and it really only has one plenary. It's a different scenario, but I think that just being straight about it and, and honest about what is happening and what you're doing by the choices that you make is really important. Thank you, everyone. Those were very insightful answers. Um, uh, I'm going to move on to the next question and uh, before I take a question from the audience. Uh, and this is for Brooke and Alice. Uh, what role can small targeted professional societies like WINS uh, play? Sure, thanks for the question. Um, I'll start and then turn it over to Alice. Uh, so, so for those who don't know, I was the founder of WINS. We founded it about four years ago. Um, and not to hijack um, Cassidy's punchline from the last session, but um, you know, structural problems need structural solutions. So things like WINS provide a structural solution and some institutional memory um, between conferences. So it's not just people meeting over coffee or in the ladies room, right? So it's like an official organized thing that happens um, at conferences and in between conferences. Um, and the kinds of things that, that helps us to implement are things like women to women mentoring, um, which we know helps uh, recruit and retrain, retain women, uh, particularly in STEM fields. Um, things like reduced barriers to access and visibility. Um, so, so especially in this last year, uh, when women with caregiving responsibilities um, had difficulty even doing research, um, you know, much less presenting it, having things like the ongoing speaker series where, where there, there, there's a bit of a barrier to access, but, but it's not huge. Um, and the lightning talks that we saw today, right, that, that, that are designed to let people present smaller results or early career results and so on. Um, so this is how you get known um, and this is how you build your network in academia. Um, you know, the, the other thing uh, that comes to mind um, and that I think we need to say out loud more often is that collecting women together helps to buffer against and, and um, mitigate against some of the harms that can happen, particularly at physical conferences. Um, so physical conferences aren't always safe places for women um, and minorities of all kinds. Um, and we've seen uh, just recently a real reckoning over in say the information science community about sexual predators at their conferences. Um, so those are the sorts of things that we know happen in whisper networks, right? So if you happen to be lucky enough to know someone who knows something about who to avoid or what places are not safe for people, then you get told. But if you don't, then you don't get told. Um, and I think moving forward as we think about returning to physical in-person conferences, kind of rendering some of those things more public and having this very visible support network um, will really help to make sure that we don't um, implement or, or institutionalize that kind of behavior um, in our societies as well. Mm -hmm. So those are all excellent points. I have to think of what to add to that. So I'll talk a bit about um, where I see the role of women in network science specifically going forward at this point. Uh, and one thing that I think is really important is that it gives people the, the it gives women in network science the chance to connect to each other and to define themselves as a group, which is not um, like a given. Like I didn't know what it means to be a woman in network science before connecting with others and kind of discussing as a group 
how do we feel, what, what do we need, what do we want? And these are discussions that are happening within the society almost every day. Um, and I hope that the society going forward can be, as, as Anne said, also a, a con connecting point or a broker between um, perhaps the larger societies, helping out how those can help women and have that ongoing discussion, have a memory um, um, over, over several years of um, what do we need at this conference this year, what wasn't going as we were hoping it would be going, what can we do better next year? And those things are also going to change depending on context. This year, everything was online. Next year, it's not going to be that anymore. So there's going to be a continuous evaluation of um, what do we need as women in network science? Where are our priorities and how can, can conferences and societies help us um, make that happen? Um, and I, I hope that, uh, that's the role that we can take as a society uh, and uh, hope to be um, in touch with um, Yamir and Laura and Anne and others um, uh, in the future as well. Thank you, Brooke and Alice, and I hope that too. <laughs> it, uh, but moving on to the evaluation of success, how, how how can we evaluate success and should we use some particular metric to track uh, the gender inequality in academia and i'm sure cassidy you have touched on uh, this a little bit but would you like to elaborate a little bit on this sure i mean one of one of the things that i think has been very well problematized and certainly not just um, from me, but in the, the use of citation metrics as one of the dominant forms. And now one of the things I didn't talk about in my talk, um, but that women, when you look not at the cumulative citations, but at the individual citations, in many ways, they fare uh, fairly well. So if we changed an evaluation system to rather, you know, limit it to five publications, and we just look at fewer number of publications and focus on quality rather than quantity, um, I think women actually would do, um, would fare much better and we would have increased equity in those kinds of evaluation systems. So um, I think that again, as I was talking about the, the way the system has been set up, um, the game favors certain players. And I think we need to, you know, going back to Brooke's wor word of looking about sort of structural answers, we need to look at the rules of the game, right? How do you win in this game? Um, and does that favor certain players and how and can we reimagine re that? And I think our tenure and promotion processes are one place where we absolutely need to reimagine it, um, as well as the evaluation mechanisms at each stage, the selection of people into programs, into jobs, um, into journals, all of those things are going to change. And, and part of that is what's been spoken about by many other people here, the representation at the top, those who are in the decision-making positions and changing that will allow us to reimagine those evaluation criteria. Thank you, Cassidy. We have two questions from the audience, which uh, I would like to take now. Uh, junior researchers are a substantially more diverse group and we are taking a risk to pursue interdisciplinary work. Uh, what are you doing to help more early career researchers stay in research careers? This is from Carolina Sudimot. So I can take a stab at it. Uh, so I think one of the things that an organization like WINS and the, the networks conferences more generally can be doing is establishing all the right um, criteria. So, so when we invite people to a speaker series, make sure they're invited lectures, right? <laughs> um, you know, when we have uh, publications associated with our conference proceedings, make sure that they're archived and indexed um, so that people get credit for the work that they're doing here. Um, and I think in addition to that, also creating opportunities for senior folk to mentor more junior folk more directly. Um, you know, I've only been through the process myself fairly recently, um, although now I'm long enough away that I've seen both sides. Um, and so much of the tenure and promotion game is about the letters that you're able to solicit. So giving people the opportunities to make those connections. And it's not that you need necessarily even, uh, you know, senior women writing those letters, right? Although there's reasons to have women to women mentoring, um, you also need senior men um, to be writing those letters. 
newsletters. So to the extent that the societies can facilitate those kinds of matchings so that people get those good letters, they know to, who to ask, and then they know that they're going to write nice letters for them. Um, that's a really valuable opportunity that we could do in this setting. Uh, we, we are, uh, I mean, I think it's, this is a problem of the, the, the whole academia. It's, it's not something that is specific to a society or whatever. Um, is that you have these compartments um, that are, you know, static from 100 years or so and they don't move. Um, so, as a society, what we are trying to do is to um, increase our presence in, in, in those places that uh, can give you credit. For example, as a society, we are trying to negotiate with publishers uh, to include sessions, specific session, uh, naming as networks as interdisciplinary physics, or even to create new journals that have these sort of research uh, as, as, you know, as the focus of the journal, etc. Because in our experience, when, when an institution sees that you have a, a journal, that you have a society, that you have sessions uh, within journals, etc., then at that point they start to think, oh, okay, this is kind of uh, something that is not a fashion thing, that is something that uh, is, is, is remaining uh, in the future, etc., and I think that then, 10 years ago, there were just a couple of research entities devoted to network science and, and interdisciplinary physics or complex systems. Now, they are increasingly more, um, and, and also there are more um, opportunities for postdocs and for faculty positions, uh, especially in Europe and the US, I think. But I think that all, in other part of the world, this will come also sooner or later. So it's, it's something that is, you know, step by step that you have to build but i think that um yeah we are on the on the right path maybe it's slower than what we would like but um that's it is i mean it's it's a, it's a huge inertia of the academia that uh, eats you <laughs> and i i can follow on um from our perspective the INSNA side of things. I mean, one of the things that we're trying um, to do is engage the membership more in opportunities for leadership. Um, and we're thinking about leadership a bit more broadly, not just leadership on the board, but also activities that help move um, the organization forward. So, I, you know, from my perspective, the young uh, scholars that are part of our membership are our future, and we want to um, engage everyone and have their voices heard. So some of those opportunities might be on committees. So I know that sounds like a service role, but at the moment we're creating our policies and procedures manuals for the organization, which really help us make decisions about um, the where we're going in the future. And we want everyone, whether, you know, wherever they are in their career stage to be involved in uh, those processes. So every year um, we're doing an annual survey to engage the membership and get um, information in terms of how they want to be involved. Um, we have several that want to grow our special interest groups um, within the organization, which WINS is sort of a model for that um, in terms of providing uh, leadership opportunities for young scientists. And we would see WINS as a, um, you know, sort of that model system that we might use for other special interest groups that are being grown within the organization. Um, we have two journals that are um, INSNA um, sponsored journals where uh, we actively um, uh, wanted to uh, change the profile of the editorial boards. Um, and so that has been an activity over the past year um, where we've uh, shifted some of the editorial board in the Journal of Social Structure. And I can give a preview. Um, 
you know, I see Kirsten is on the, <laughs> on the call here, but Kirsten is going to be a co-editor of Connections uh, with Dan Halgen uh, moving forward. So uh, this is a, a really important um, component of uh, the leadership in some what we're focused on. I also want to speak to sort of these informal connections, and I know there's a question coming up, so I'm going to give my response to that now. Um, but one of the things that happened at last year's um, WINS um, meeting, uh, we brainstormed some potential activities that uh, we might uh, engage in moving forward. And one of those wa was writing retreats. And uh, Meg Patterson uh, took the lead in developing these writing retreats where we were meeting, uh, by, I think, twice a week. There were two meetings a week. Um, I w benefited from this um, meeting with this amazing group of young women in these writing retreats. And it actually was uh, really important to get me through the pandemic um, and the work from home. It was just such a welcoming and supportive um, space. Um, and I'd love to see that those sorts of activities moving forward. Um, and I think what, what was really wonderful about it, and, and I, it is not just the, the structured time to work on writing, but the fact that um, we were there to support each other in other domains. You know, I had this great group of women who reviewed a manuscript for me and <laughs> pre-reviewed it and gave me some wonderful feedback. Um, some were involved in sort of transitions in terms of their, um, their jobs and their, um, you know, where they are in the promotion pipeline. And so that created opportunities for to discuss, us to discuss our experiences and what worked for us, what didn't work, how we had to sort of think about, um, you know, the promotion and tenure process in um, our um, institutions, which may be different depending upon the institution that you're in um, or the discipline that you're in. And so I think these informal connections um, are really, really powerful in creating the structures, as Brooke said, um, to keep them moving forward. Thank you, Laura. That's a, actually a very nice segue to the second question that we have from the audience from Lisette Espinobua. Sorry if I butchered your name. Uh, uh, question is that they can see a trade-off between virtual and physical conferences. Many people miss the online benefits of uh, networking, but also virtual events allow more people to join, engage, and network at a different level. Uh, so do you think uh, hybrid events can improve the collaboration, visibility, networking, that, that sort of things? Thoughts on that? Well, I mentioned some things in the chat on this, but I, I think it is really a, a mixed kind of thing that we have to approach with caution. So all virtual events, there's no doubt that they've improved accessibility to many different populations, whether we're thinking about disability or people who are under-resourced in any way, people who have mobility constraints, um, all of those ways we've improved accessibility and that's been fantastic. Um, also, as Brooke talked about, we haven't talked a lot in this, um, a panel about sexual harassment and other forms of hostility, places that are unsafe for women or other vulnerable populations just to attend a conference. Um, and then the unsafe environments that are created within those conferences by certain kinds of social events that we create. So all of that is removed in a virtual world, which is fantastic. Um, my concern though, is making mobility a luxury of the elite and then creating and recreating the disparities in that if only certain populations are mobile and that becomes a very small population, uh, we know what the consequence of that will be. And it'll allow for, for again, for the sort of perpetuation of many of these inequities. And I think hybrid conferences, I'm just 
really afraid of creating a two-tiered system where we create a sort of a lower tiered thing for people to get some experiences. And then again, an elite system for those who can attend in, per in person. So I think we just have to be really attentive as we move forward in this, that we don't lose the accessibility we created through the virtual spaces, um, but we don't create systems that again, perpetuate these inequities that we've observed. So I think we need to proceed with caution, I would say. Yeah, I, I agree with that because um, on the other hand, hybrid conferences are the expensive one. So that will have the unwanted side effect of increasing the registration fee, which creates additional barriers for participation. Because you have to have what it costs you an on-site conference plus the technology to also have, uh, I don't know, thousand people connected online and interacting with those that are on site. So uh, yeah, I agree with you. I think that we should look for ways to uh, make a conference more accessible, but not necessarily the hybrid format is the, the way to go. I um, think hybrid conferences are coming. Um, and I think the answer is how do you want to respond to it rather than if you're gonna respond to it, because I think you're gonna have demand. Um, and we have over 1,700 and I think it's 1,750 now people who are participating in Networks 2021. I think it's safe to say this is the largest Networks conference. Um, I feel, I'm feeling confident right now. I haven't heard anyone to be able to tell me that there's been a bigger one, but I know that a large number of people wanted to participate and, and the fees that we were charging were too high um, because now they have the capability of participating because they could not have traveled in any circumstances. Um, and now they can travel and I really hate to see that go away out of a fear of two tiered systems entirely, because get, being able to speak at a conference is important, even if it's virtual, um, it can still be a line in a CD, it can still be important. It doesn't necessarily have to be asterisk. Um, I was there or I wasn't there. It can still be, uh, it can still be a critical thing. So I, I don't have the solution and I do, I share Cassidy's concerns, but I, I think we have to proceed as if, how do we do this as opposed to whether or not we will. Well, you, you are our chair of uh, conference committee, so you better think what to do. <laughs> you are the more this experienced. This was supposed, we thought this would be a hybrid conference. <laughs> Silly us. Um, and, and I was really sweating it because the cost of that conference would have been very high. And then the hybrid aspect would be so appealing. And yet in order to be able to be financially viable, we would have had to charge a lot more and it would, it was just it, then knowing where you've hit your tipping point. I mean, it's not fun to talk about conference finances. If anybody's ever interested in doing it, I'm happy to talk to you about it, but it costs money to run events and it doesn't, the money doesn't come out of thin air and sponsors don't just drop into your lap. And, you know, it's not, it, it, it people pay for the experience that they're receiving in some version um, and so I think that that's the, that's, that's one of the real challenges with this. Yep, sorry, I'll quit. I see Brooke's hand. Is yeah, I, uh, I certainly appreciate the tension here around, uh, managing conferences, um, that have hybrid and are virtual and, and in-person, uh, experiences. I, and I, I totally agree that we probably don't have a choice, uh, that we probably will be expected to create hybrid conferences. And so I, uh, would like to encourage us to think broadly about what it would take to pull that off in an equitable way. Um, and we're not going to get equity, uh, right out the gate here, but we could think about things. Um, I know over in my other major disciplinary conference, the International Communication Association is setting up satellite links in Africa, um, to try to buffer against some of the internet speeds. Um, so we're spending money, uh, from the, uh, from the organization in order to, uh, you know, make that work really well. They're also, you know, we're communication scholars. So we're also doing things like immersive virtual experiences. So things where you have life-size screens potentially. So you actually can talk sort of face-to-face -face, uh, with someone virtual. So thinking creatively, not just about, you know, having a Zoom conference and then a physical conference, but where exactly could we insert some money or could we insert some hybridization in order to create meaningful experiences, even if it doesn't capture everyone in the first uh, time out, but then we can build on those sorts of things. Uh, I might just add, I think there's lots of uh, excellent ideas floating around here. Uh, I do think that um, 
since we've, we've gone virtual, there's no way to 100% roll that back. It's been, there's too many advantages to that to completely abandon the, the, the format. And I love to see that there, we have lots of people, even just at the satellite from different countries where I'm pretty sure that only a fraction of those would have been able to attend otherwise. Um, one, one thing that uh, I, I think is an option if we do have to create a two tier, tier system of experience at a conference to have the upper tier subsidize the lower tier to also bring down the costs for um, virtual participation because it would be a second tier to it. There's also other things that um, might actually enhance the experience for um, virtual participants because with um, the pandemic hopefully coming to an end at some point, um, there would be the possibility of having local, locally in-person satellites so people by country or by city could come together to experience the virtual program and then network within each other. And I think there would be a value to that too. I have to disagree on the lower, on the, on the uh, thinking of a higher tier and a lower tier and having them subsidize because you create incentives that are going to recreate the situation that you're starting. So somebody really trying to make it to an in-person conference because they're a postdoc, because they're trying to get it, they're scraping together everything they have, having them subsidize the additional expense of having people be in a hybrid format. It, it's, it's a real, it, it really does create a very difficult thing. I just don't think there is an easy answer to it. I have heard a lot of different scenarios about setting registration rates exactly the same um, and offering um, travel scholarships to people to, you know, incentivize them to come. But I don't think anybody's cracked this nut yet because it really hasn't started happening yet. Um, I mean, there were a few hybrid conferences before COVID and now people are now experimenting. So watch people try <laughs> and then learn from their mistakes. But it is, it's risky business financially to, to do all of that. And then have you yourself create a situation in which everybody says, well, you know, I'm going to save a thousand dollars and I'm just going to go virtual. And then you've made a tier that's so expensive and it can't even maintain. And I saw a note from Cassidy about not wanting to have things in expensive hotels. That's about the size of your meeting because there are very few universities anymore or public spaces where you can be that are inexpensive, where you can actually locate and meeting and meeting space is hard to come by in a way that's actually, um, you know, where, where they're actually going to be. I know that NetSci is now going to have a trouble being in a, in a university anymore. Uh, Rome was going to be one of the ones that we thought we could do it because they have big plenary spaces that we can be in, but it is, that is a real challenge trying to find, um, like for instance, university spaces, which I feel are really great for conferences. I wish that we could do that. So Anne, I'd love to pick your brain some on these ideas. I, this is a hybrid meeting is actually like a very big topic of discussion um, right now for INSNA and I'm sure it is for um, NetSci. And we're trying to figure out how, um, how to, I, I guess, move forward um, with our decisions, which likely have to be done relatively soon, given that we're hoping to have some sort of hybrid conference um, this time next year. So what advice would you give to us um, as we're in this decision process? Like what sh should we do? We're, we're planning to do, for example, a member survey. Um, and try to crowdsource um, expertise in this area as best we can. But do you have any thoughts on sort of in the next few weeks? I, have <laughs> that we should do? I don't want to take the conversation too far away from women in network science. So, but, but what I think that this is pointing to is, um, is that the uh, access is important and thinking through access at all levels is important. And access is not just about particular groups of people and making sure that they're represented. It's also making sure that they're accommodated. So um, when you have an international conference like what we're doing right now, you have international time zones. We have 17 different time zones <laughs> is the last I counted. Um, 
we, I mean, everybody literally all over the world. And so there's no way to be, there's no way to have a time that's very accommodating to everyone um, to participate in that. But, but the other thing is that now we're having people who come from low resource institutions who are interested. So you might have a professor um, at a low resource institution who has no more money than a graduate student at a high resource institution to be able to attend something. So thinking about rank in terms of faculty rank as a way of distinguishing between people, that's also <laughs> not going to work there either. But the but the, but once we become accommodating to people overall, we become accommodating, uh, like once we start thinking about accommodating people with disabilities, um, having transcriptioning in all of your meetings, that's something that actually having a hybrid meeting allows you to do because you can, if you're filming something, you can have things running through a um, uh, an AI uh, machine that is actually creating a live transcript that somebody could be watching in the room who otherwise would not have had that. We would have had to go through the old sort of um, teletyping services or having other things. It may not be perfect, but that's a step forward to accountability or to accessibility. Having people do things like post lecture slides or post pre-recordings or having those sorts of things that people complain, oh, I don't like it. It it gets in the way of my norm. My norm is to do my my presentation five minutes before the I'm done and be changing it up to the minute. My norm is to do it in person because I love the energy. But once you start thinking, well, what is the purpose of this? You actually can step back and be more accessible to a range of people. Um, and it's not targeting one particular group, but it is, it's benefiting all. And that's the kind of thing where I think equity and access are, um, you know, thinking very broadly about them is really important with conferences. But yeah, I have a lot of ideas about the hybrid stuff. I don't know, but is the bottom line though. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to try to attend in person, but um, I'll reach out to you. <laughs> yeah. But thank you. Cool. I think those are great points. Yep. We have this next sign X that actually was created, you know, this is more small size uh, conference that actually was created, especially to, you know, promote that for science in parts of the world that were not uh, particularly, you know, um, uh, rich or, or to not have uh, the same kind of opportunity that Europe or the US and we have been in, 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 you know, in countries like Brazil and some countries in Europe uh, as well. So um, we went to Asia as well. So I think that's, um, yeah, that's also something that we, we can explore a little bit more. But yeah, um, it's a complex problem. Wonderful con uh, conversation and complicated hybrid problem to solve. <laughs> but uh, I'll ask a last question before uh, open it up to the audience and this should be fun. Uh, if you could change one thing about your universities or research institutes, professional societies to make a positive impact to gender equality, what would that be? Uh, I would love personally to do away um, with the arbitrary timelines that we impose on people. <laughs> so I, I think that this um, almost universally disadvantages uh, women, people of color, and people with disabilities to have things like early career scholar awards and um, to have things, you know, like arbitrarily, you need six years to keep your job for life or to get fired. Uh, so I, you know, I appreciate that those things help move people through certain kinds of milestones and pipelines. Um, but especially this year, I think we've all seen how having arbitrary uh, deadlines for people who are by all accounts making good progress on the, towards their degrees or in their postdocs, et cetera. Um, you know, it's kind of turned people through, uh, will almost certainly create the leaky pipeline or perpetuate the leaky pipeline we always talk about. In my case, it's very, very simple. I am not talking now as president of the society, but as a professor at the university, um, is, is uh, to enforce uh, the law. So there are a lot of things that you can actually do that you are not doing, and by law you should have done that. So uh, just enforcing the law is is that would be enough for the time being. I mean, um, we have recently a case here in Spain, for example, um, of a project evaluation, and that was a review where he was not a Spanish. It seemed that he was not a Spanish, but uh, European. Um, uh, he made some unfortunate comments like, uh, for example, that uh, 
uh, they were um, spread, actually included half women uh, and uh, half uh, males. Um, he was complaining about the fact that uh, the IP of the project was not um, considering the risk of pregnancy as a risk for the projects, and, and, and there is no contingency measure to, uh, you know, these sort of things. Of course, this was kind of voiced, and, and the, the agency took uh, some measures, and actually the, the reviewer is, is not uh, considered anymore. But anyway, this shows you that there are a lot of things that are still there that you don't see. Uh, but this is because the, the report became public, but otherwise you don't see that. And I think that's enforcing the law and, and the committee that should have overseen those kind of evaluations should have done more than just pass that to, to the IP. So that sort of thing shouldn't have been taken into account. So I think that if I were um, to choose one measure is just to for I mean to enforce the law because uh, sometimes it's as easy as that. I think for for me, I would replace or maybe place for the first time the emphasis around the scientist over science evaluation. I think that we have moved to a system where science evaluation is at the forefront of all the conversations. And in many ways, we've forgotten about science and we've forgotten about those who do science or the scientists. And with our overwhelming obsession on scientific evaluation, um, I, I think we've lost sight of a lot of that. And I think just replacing our energies on the scientists, ensuring that scientists have the resources they need to thrive understanding that scientists are human beings with lives and contexts that exist outside of it um, and at being attentive to those issues, just refitting what we what it means to be a scientist and what a scientist looks like, I think will make science better um, and deprioritizing the, the overemphasis on scientific evaluation, um, which I, I think has become obscenely prioritized within higher education. Yeah, I want to echo that, Cassidy. I, I loved what you said there. And I, I think related to that um, is creating a psychologically safe space um, that um, acknowledges diversity in approaches um, and translating that into leadership roles and making sure that you have a visible um, leadership that represents the variety of um, of perspectives that people have. I mean, one of the things that I see um, in some organizations is that the leadership style is the same uh, for everyone who's in a leadership role. I don't, you know, like, I, I don't know if they have a Myers-Briggs or a DISC um, metric that is used in everyone who has this certain personality profile is, is deemed, you know, leadership material. But, you know, we know from um, the literature that diversity um, is an important component to creativity and success and innovation. And so making sure that that diversity is represented um, in leadership roles, I think is uh, one priority that I would suggest. I have a doubt, um, um, I will take the opportunity to ask of you because here in academia is, is not, um, uh, the difference is not really huge because actually in, you are, I mean, the same category of professorship um, um, in terms of salary and, and talking. So you, you have a few categories and what is a barrier for women and other minorities to act, to promote. So the percentage of people that are full professor is ridiculously low compared to the male uh, and females, etc. But not in, but once you are there, there are no difference in terms of salaries. 
Um, so I, I was wondering whether, in that sense, is also when I said enforcing the law. But in Spain, not uh, out of academia, there are a lot of differences when you go to, um, you know, administrative scenes. There are a lot of differences in what a female earns and what a male doing the same work or even less uh, earn. So I don't know how is that in the U.S. or a part of the world. So I'm sorry because uh, I'm. I haven't had the chance to get some data about that. Yeah, Brooke may want to respond to this as well, but the US doesn't use a salary scale for it. So the salary compression issues in the US are really strong even at that level. Um, but sort of beyond salary, I'll say that you're right, we don't see as many women in senior roles as you would expect given their influx. I mean, women have been out matriculating men in biology for 20 years, and we still don't see that representation at the full professor level. So the notion that this is organic and it'll fix itself over time is certainly not happening. And those that we do see in those full professor roles, their profile, if we look in their bibliometric profile, looks very similar to the men, but that's the selection bias. It is those women who make themselves in the image of the men who've been successful that are able to get into that space. And so that's what I'm meaning in sort of reconceptualizing what it means to be a scientist, is that someone with a very different portfolio who's contributed to science, perhaps in a very different way, should also be acknowledged with the rewards and the roles and the leadership and visibility positions that men have. So I think it goes beyond salary, even though salary remains an issue in several countries that don't have um, set salary scales. I'm gonna make a, a brief uh, statement that's very different and then I'm gonna have to go, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'm gonna ask you to think beyond academia um, in this and I'm gonna ask you to think about people that are in your community here who may not end up in a professorial role, who may not end up in a research role, um, who may not ever be in the tenure track. And I'm gonna raise my own hand as somebody who is one of those people. I'm in a professional staff position, I have a PhD. I was trained in network science. I'm not alone. And I would say, if you look around and think about it, you actually have a number of people who are in this kind of roles who play really important parts within your society. Uh, and most of them are women um, who are a part of the getting things done. Um, group. And so part of the message that comes across in a lot of this is that to have success needs to be being a full professor in the end, um, or to follow this track. And it can leave people who don't achieve it or don't want it in a place that feels like they're less than. And so I'd like to have, uh, I know this is an academic, these are academic conferences, but they're conferences that are very attractive to people and the topics are very attractive to people who are not always gonna be in that world. And so being thoughtful about that as well, not seeing them as interlopers, not seeing them as people that should have to pay a lot more money to go, although we do tier our registration fees and things, but thinking about them as actual equal members of your community and their concerns and interests are also valid, um, that they're worthy of service, uh, recognition that they're worthy of leadership roles because they're stable and in the community as, as other people are. So I just want to put that uh, little thing there because I think if we think about um, some people who've really put a lot of effort in, uh, and I'm not talking about myself, but a lot of other people that have put their effort in that, that sometimes that doesn't get recognized because perhaps their role is not as glamorous as it might be um, in, in a uh, full professor position at a high ranking institution. And if we start doing that, then we also start thinking about people who are in low resource institutions who might also be able to contribute in other ways, whose research may not get published in nature or science um, or in social networks, but who can still be a really important contributing member to our community. So with that, <laughs> I apologize, I have to leave, um, but thank you very much for uh, inviting me here. And I hope you guys are, you excuse me, everyone here is enjoying uh, the conference and that um, if you're participating in the main conference next week, that you get yourself logged into Whova and that you uh, figure that site out. Um, sorry, it's unwieldy, but with a thousand talks, there was almost no way to make it uh, anything less. So um, I'll leave you with it. Goodbye. Thank you, Anne. Bye -bye. Thank you, Anne. I want to raise a point that Brooke has raised in the chat and it's gotten a lot of um, attention in there as well. So the, 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 the um, issue of uh, valuing service in tenure promotion, 
uh, for me as a postdoc, tenure promotion is not kind of on my radar right now, just kind of making it on the tenure track for that as well. And so um, we have these uh, motions of having stuff like DEI statements that I need to add to my um, um, uh, application packets and such, but it seems that it's not really at this point uh, really combating the problem. Uh, from from what I get, it's like service is great. People like to see it these days, and that's an improvement. But it doesn't it it it, it doesn't seem to really tip the scale in your favor if, if you actually need it to. So, for example, um, service is nice if I'm competing against somebody else who has exactly the same amount of papers. It's not likely to going to make a change if the number of papers doesn't match. And that doesn't, it just doesn't make any sense to me at this point, because if, if papers is, is the single, the, the one single thing that we value, even if, if like just the number of papers, even, which is, which is a questionable measure of success anyhow, to me, it signals that what our community needs is more papers. And I would strongly disagree with that, that that is the single most thing that we need right now. There's a lot of things that I think are much more important. And that because I think they are important, I am willing to invest my time in that. And I would like the community to, to value that going forward. And this is not just for me, this is for the entire team behind WIND. This is for other teams who do um, other DEI work in, in other capacities. We constantly have to kind of decide for ourselves what risks are we willing to take to make a positive contribution to this community. And those risks are the same, very same community later on punishing us for having invested our time into the community rather than into our personal advancement. And I'm definitely seeing that where people that I think have contributed a lot um, are kind of um, uh, leave, leaving the community and making place for people who do excellent research, but really just that. They've been in their chamber doing their thing um, and may or may not be interested in shaping this community going forward. And that is something that I don't understand. That is something that is happening right now. So we see people leaving right now. And for me, that is the one thing that I would like to see changed and rather sooner than later, that we value the service that people do, that we think about. This is, this is not just something nice to add onto a CV. This is something that makes up for a missing paper. This is something that makes up for missing teaching or whatnot. So that it's really some that, that there's a currency attached to it and not just some some extra kind of decor element on the CV. Thank you, Alice. I can definitely echo that. When I was doing my PhD and I had my paper almost towards the last year, I was very worried and I was talking to my advisor saying, I'm not going to get any job anywhere because I don't have any paper. So, but he was very nice in calming me down. But yeah, I have seen that the first question I have been asked is, uh, why so low number of papers? And I was very discouraged at one point of time. But, um, Unfortunately, Alice, I do have to leave because I have another meeting that I need to attend to, but I will hand this over to Francesca so that you all guys can continue uh, discussing the, on a lot of questions. We have a couple of questions from the audience as well, and Francesca is going to take it over. And thank you all the panelists for being here and answering the questions. And bye, have a good day. Thank you, Valerie, for hosting. Thank you for your service. And I will say, I mean, I'm, I'm usually so depressing. So I want to say like something positive. I, one of the, the fantastic things, I mean, Brooke mentioned she is now a chair. I am a chair of a department. And so I do see things changing as people who are in these decision making um, positions are able to bring some of that insight here. Um, Emma wrote in the chat about IUPUI's new path um, towards promotion and tenure based on DEI work. And I have to say in my time at Indiana University, I was always pleased that they had a balanced case for tenure. So one could go up on a case of teaching research and service um, and that they have a service track for promotion to full professor. So there are institutions who are institutionalizing 
um, this. Now, of course, it's still decided by people, but serving on the campus level promotion and tenure position at, at IU, I can say that people really were looking at portfolios which were fundamentally different than you would see 10 years ago and looking at them favorably. So I think change is happening, but it takes um, very loud voices um, constantly pushing this. So there, there is work to be done, but I, I do see some scales tipping. So at least that's my one point of optimism for my otherwise mostly depressing <laughs> contributions. So I may see, thank you very much. Uh, Yami, you want to? No, no, I, I was just going to agree with um, with what, what Cassidy said. I mean, it's, uh, it's something that is slowly changing, but it's, it's something that is changing. And I think that's, um, that's why I was voting for, um, calling for more senior uh, people to be in this sort of uh, conf, I mean, in this sort of exchange, because those are the ones that are normally sitting in committees, et cetera, that can actually try to change things. And at least from the society, what we try to do is every time that we have the chance to discuss these issues with someone, just try to uh, highlight this and, and try to you know uh, get as much as we can of of these calls etc also we've revised the the calls when they are submitted to the websites of the society just to see if there is nothing that uh, you know violates flagrantly um what we think that should be uh position advertisement etc so I don't know if any of the other panelists would like to add something to add, or maybe we can just move to, because we have two questions and we already have a long time <laughs> in the discussion panel. It has been wonderful, but maybe we can just go to those questions. So we have some questions from Sam Rosenblatt that I don't know if he's around there. Uh, but he was asking before, a long time ago, <laughs> if Cassidy, can you add something about how societies can create boundaries and how create, how to create permeability? And uh, he's interested specifically for uh, the young society of network science. And I, I wrote some in the chat, so I won't say too much on this here, but I, I do think that platforms such as conferences, but other kinds of institutions should see themselves more in, in brokering relationships and allowing more nimble activities to take place. So instead of envisioning that we have to keep replicating the past every time, creating the same kind of format, being more dynamic, allowing for the new ideas and the new energies and the new directions to come into place, allowing and taking more risks, allowing things to fail. And in many ways, moving away from maybe the big giant conferences, um, but allowing more spaces for people to, um, to let ideas come from the bottom rather than always um, imposed from the top. So I, I think Frankly, and I say this as a president of a professional societies, I am not sure of the continued need for professional societies in the way we have articulated our value in the past. I think that there may be a need, but it has to be wildly reimagined because right now it is just a perpetuation of the status quo and most large conferences are as well. I think this event has been fantastic, but this is the kind of event that's taking advantage of energy and conversations that are happening. And I think we need more like this um, and less that are effectively job market conferences masked with travel opportunities. Um, so I think that we just need to be more attentive to those directions and give more visibility to the emergent ideas rather than the dominant canonical space. I'm, I'm going to add as a, as a long time member of, of, of the symposium for young network scientists and a big fan of Sam's work here that um, I think the society has been incredibly valuable and um, one, one thing that we see also going backward in time in terms of the events that SINS has organized at conferences over the last few years is that it's been incredibly creative so if we have young people who get together and who think of if we're designing a conference satellite or a pre-conference event, what is that going to look like? Is this just going to be more talks by more people or how are we going to do this in a way that it benefits the people who go to, to participate and the people who are there to speak? Um, there has been 
lots of different formats. They had their unravel a paper session. This year we had a, a science communication in the digital era. Um, and we're also, when we were organizing the, the wind satellite, so this event, we were also thinking of how can we use the, the time and resources that we have to create something that is interesting for the people that, that, that we want to target and that helps the people who are, who are presenting here. And I, I, I think it's really great to, that we have the space to, to try these things out and to see what works and then next year we can probably build on that. So I'm, I'm thankful that we've gotten that space. Uh, and I think that um, uh, especially the Symposium for Young Network Science Scientists has, has shown that there's a lot of very creative ways that you could think of redesigning conference format. So we have one another question from Leonie. Uh, maybe you would like to just do it because I can see. Sure, I can also ask myself if there's still time for a last one. I would love to know um, how WINS as a society, as we're just like forming and developing, um, what do you think, how can we best develop to be most effective in supporting women and non-binary and transgender? So like, what are key things that you think this society should focus on and what is like specifically important? as we're like still developing. I mean, I can take a stab at that because it's a critique of my own self. Um, so, so one of the things um, I would love for the organization now that is bigger and has fresh leadership um, to do is to kind of double down and, and reinterrogate the idea of women in network science. Um, so, so I started it um, together with Kate Karanjas, who I see is in the room, um, in like, uh, frankly, a moment of desperation, right? So, so I, I, like there's only, you know, like one-off meetings with other women in the bathrooms and things, we need to do something more organized, uh, but we were narrow in our scope, right? So I think we've done okay, but we could think uh, more inclusively, particularly about women in the global South um, with very different experiences than, um, you know, than I've had in my lifetime. Thinking about uh, trans women, so non-cisgender women um, and how we might be, uh, you know, marginalizing uh, them um, and or folks who are non-binary, just even with our, the name of the organization, right? So um, thinking a bit more broadly and inclusively about those things. And particularly, I think it's an interesting time to do that because it intersects with all these urgent conversations about hybrid conferences and, and you know, remote events and things like that. So I would love to, to encourage the organization's leadership to, to expand in that way and give you a uh, license to the extent that you need it to, to do things like change the name or, or imagine the vision uh, of what this organization does. So great. Uh, thank you very much to everyone, uh, for all the people in the audience, for all the panelists, for having the time. Can I uh, yeah, sure. Just, just a final sin as the president of the society, we are always open to receive any kind of suggestions, initiatives, and to consider it. So. Uh, uh, I, I think that it's also important um, for our community to know that we 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 don't usually do top down only. We also would like to consider solutions that are you know bottom up that arrive to all from, from the members. So if anyone has any suggestion, please uh, make sure that this suggestion reach us because that would be considered for sure and you will get an answer and we will discuss this in the board or in the committee or whatever it is uh, more effective and brooke uh, i will contact you soon don't worry i, I haven't forgot thank you very much um so maybe we could just wrap it up uh, because we actually have a socializing uh, platform that we are using to just go there and having a chat, talking about your favorite pet, maybe, or talking about your experience in networks. Those were some of the topics yesterday I list. So everybody is invited. It's already the link in the chat. I can see it. So everybody's invited in there just pop up maybe five minutes and maybe you're going to have a lot of fun. So thank you very much, everyone. All the panelists were fantastic and all the audience too. So have a nice day.